ராதா சார் ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணலாம் சார் ஜெய் ஸ்ரீ கிருஷ்ணா குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன் எவ்ரி ஒன் பிரேயர் தமிழ் தாய் வாழ்த்து ஃபாலோடு பை காலேஜ் பிரேயர் நீராரும் கடலுடன் நிலமடந்து கெழிலொழுகும் சீராரும் அதனமென திகழ்வரத கண்டமிது எக்கணமும் அதி சிறந்த திராவிடனல் திருநாளும் தக்க சிறு பிரிமுகரும் தரித்தனரும் திலகமுமே அத்திலக வாசனை போல் அனைத்துலகும் இன்பமுற எத்தி செய்யும் புகழ் மணக்க இருந்த பெரும் தமிழனங்கே தமிழனங்கே உன் சீரிழமை திறம் மிகுந்து செயல்மறந்த வாழ்த்ததுமே வாழ்த்ததுமே சத்தியோரதம் சத்தியபரம் திரிசத்தியம் சத்தியசியோனிம் நிஹிதம் சத்தியம் ருதசத்தியநேத்ரம் சத்தியாத்மகம் தாம் சரணம் பிரபன்னா வாணிணாக்கோச்சு மனஸ்தவோர்னிரஸ்தவ நிவாசிரணாஷ்டிஸ்தாம் நமோ கிருஷ்ணாயாத்தேன radhakrishnan sir please unmute and talk sir it's muted radhakrishnan sir hello radhakrishnan sir can you unmute and talk Ah, okay. Okay. My, my voice is audible? Yes, sir. My voice yes. is audible? I, yes, please go ahead now. Uh, Jai Shri Krishna. Good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of Department of Mathematics, D.G. Vaishnav College, I warmly welcome you all for the seventh day, first day, first session faculty development program on aspects of mathematics. For today's session, we have our speaker with us. Dr. R. Sivaraman, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics, D.G. Vaishnav College. I welcome you, sir. Dr. Sivaraman does not need 
a special introduction because his profile speaks a lot about him. He completed MSc, MPhil, PhD in mathematics, and also he is qualified JR of NET in the year 1999. His area of research specialization is number theory, analysis, and applied mathematics. Sar published more than 85 articles in reputed national and international journals. Dr. Sivaraman produced seven MPhil scholars and is an editorial board member and a reviewer of reputed national and international journals. Dr. R. Sivaraman also published 20 books and is a member of several professional societies such as American Mathematical Society, Ramonujan Mathematical Society, Indian Mathematical Society, London Mathematical Society, to a name few. He has delivered special lectures in various government and private universities and colleges. He has also received a number of awards to his credentials. Today, our speaker is going to talk about on some open problems in mathematics. On behalf of the Department of Mathematics, DG Vaishwa College, I hand over the session to you, sir. So, uh, thanks, Dr. Radha Krishnan, for introducing me. Uh, it gives me uh, happiness and uh, pleasure in presenting what little I know amongst you today. Uh, my Before I start, I my special thanks to our head of the department, uh, Professor R. Venetramanan, who trusted me in presenting this and gave an opportunity. So, I will be talking about on some open problems in mathematics. This topic is uh, somewhat different from others. See, there were 14 talks in this FDP. And all, I think almost all the rest of the talks were focused on key aspects, like they have given some special topic on this. But I am the, probably the only person to have been presenting in a special, uh, different idea, not mainly focused on a particular uh, concept, but for presenting some open problems on um, emerging on different areas of mathematics. So I hope this uh, ideas will stimulate young uh, faculty, at least some of the faculty who are working and who join newly into teaching profession to get some motivation and work out in future. So with this uh, short introduction, I shall begin my presentation here. So is the screen visible? Hello? Yeah, visible, visible. Yeah, visible. Okay. So I will begin with uh, probably two millennium old uh, problem. See, the problems which are not unsolved, but seems to be true are called conjectures. So conjecture is the name for uh, problems which are not resolved so far but it remains to be true upon verification. So I begin with twin prime conjecture, which means, see primes uh, are very special numbers among galaxy of number that we have in our counting system. Prime numbers occupy a very special place. And among prime numbers, there is a special mention about what's called twin primes. Now this uh, portrait here of Euclid was considered to be uh, the one who compiled the first book on mathematics and uh, he mentioned about prime numbers in his ninth volume of uh, the most famous book called Elements. And he, in that Elements book, he proved that there are infinitely many primes, which was considered to be one of the very classic proof. Uh, we, see, if you want to have a look at a very good proof, you have to look at that particular proof by Euclid, which was a very wonderful proof. We take uh, so assume that the contradiction that there are only finitely many primes. Take the product and add one to it. You arrive at a contradiction. Therefore, by proof of contradiction, you can prove that there are infinitely many primes. This is a short gist of how Euclid showed that there are infinitely many primes. Now, coming to twin primes. Now, Euclid proved that there are infinitely many primes some 2,300 2, years ago. Not now. So it was very very early time. Now, since then, people were guessing that there are infinitely many twin primes also. What is a twin prime? The twin prime is a pair of primes with two differences between them. Like uh, prime numbers of the form p, comma p plus 2. Any pair of the form p, comma p plus 2 for where p is a prime number is called a twin prime. Simply speaking, numbers like 3, comma 5, 5, comma 7, uh, 
11 comma 13 17 comma 19 29 31 these numbers are twin primes which are showed here and if you list down those list of twin primes you see these are all multiples of six and twin primes either will look like multiple of six minus one and multiple of six plus one so the of course uh, three comma five is an exception to this rule so any pair of twin prime will look like multiple of six minus one and multiple of six plus one the rest of all except three comma five the first pair of twin prime all the other twin primes will either belong to the first one will belong to the this category like multiple of six minus one and second category in the pair will belong to multiple of six plus one so either it, it is six n minus one or six n plus one or something like that okay so it, it aligns very neatly you have some pattern for twin primes but unfortunately even observing this pattern mathematicians for over two millennia could not show that there are infinitely many primes this is one of the uh, oldest unsolved problem that exists uh, to go with another oldest unsolved problem like existence of odd perfect numbers so i have spoken in brief about perfect numbers in my webinar before um, so there exist i mean people cannot find odd perfect number as of now but they believe such a number would exist and if it exists it's a huge number that is all we know but no one has come up with an existence of odd perfect number now what happened is twin primes are numbers of the form multiples of six minus one multiple of six plus one except the first twin prime which is three comma five in general twin prime differ by two between them pair of primes differing by two are called twin primes okay so so those twin primes are marked with blue color here as you can see so 23 of course uh, 23 plus 2 is 25 25 is not a prime number it's a composite number so this doesn't form a twin prime whereas 29 comma 31 is a twin prime 41 comma 43 just like uh, there are infinitely many prime numbers right from euclid's period people believe that there are infinitely many twin primes but unfortunately no proof has been given till today this is one of uh, unsolved problem that remains uh, in mathematicians field now listen I observed this property that if you take set of integers modulo 6, which is from 0 to 5, that these are all class of numbers which are uh, divisible by 6. These are all class of numbers which gives reminder 1 upon dividing by 6 up to 5. And because if you divide any number by 6, the maximum possible remainder is 5. So this 5 will be class of all numbers which are divisible when divided by 6 gives remainder 5. Okay, so this is Z6 and we know that Z6 comma plus 6 under addition modulo 6, this forms a cyclic group. And interestingly, you find for this particular cyclic group, the elements 1 and 5 will form uh, the generators for this particular cyclic group. This I observed myself. And if you look at this table here, these are all numbers which are 6 or plus 5. I mean, these are all numbers which gives remainder 5 upon dividing by 6. And these are all numbers which gives remainder 1 upon dividing by 6. And these numbers are precisely 1 and 5 here. So this uh, twin primes form generator for cyclic group of 6 elements. They are generators and inverse of 1 is 5 and inverse of 5 is 1. So they form a good pattern even in cyclic groups, not only in numbers. Okay. Now, uh, as I mentioned, pair of the numbers of the form p comma p plus 2 for p prime number is called twin prime twin prime conjecture says that there are infinitely many twin primes in fact a mathematician called polignac extended this idea and he conjectured that there are infinitely many primes of the form p comma p plus 2k and if k is 1 you get twin prime conjecture so primes uh, which differ by 4 for example primes which differ by 6 primes which differ by 8 so primes which differ by some even number of the form 2k now he conjectured that there are infinitely many primes of the form p comma p plus 2k and then that general conjecture is called polignac conjecture now several mathematicians right from ancient time to modern time were vigorously working on resolving the twin prime conjecture but uh, unfortunately not a very good improvement was shown until uh, 2013 where when itang zhang uh, american mathematician Proved that limit infimum of pn plus 1 minus pn is less than n. That means this result conveys the fact that there are infinitely many primes whose difference is less than 7 mil uh, here, uh, 70 million. 7 followed by 7 zeros. So he showed that there are infinitely many twin primes less than n, where n is 70 million. 
this uh, bound upper bound for difference of primes is too high i mean in terms of uh, numbers and therefore people started working in the project called polymath project and uh, james minard and terence stoke james minard is a young mathematician who got sasra ramanujan prize for the, his work on twin prime conjecture and terence stoke needs no introduction he is one of the best living mathematicians as of today he is a field medalist from the year 2006 and uh, he is one of best mathematicians to be living as of now so these two people involving in polymath project reduced this upper bound given by zhang from 70 million to 246 of course uh, using this particular idea like eliot uh, halbert stamp conjecture they could even reduce this 246 bound to 12 comma 6 but this remains as a conjecture so 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 far we can't take this as a guaranteed if this conjecture fails then this bound will be false but anyway we now know that uh, there are infinitely many primes of difference up to 246 now we have to try to bring this down and once this bound comes to 2 we are through we will be proving twin prime conjecture that there are uh, infinitely many primes which differ by 2 so this is what the current status and these three people are uh, very important for break, making big breakthroughs in the recent times, right from the, for the last six or seven years. Uh, Zhang is here, James Minot, and uh, Terence Stowe. Now, uh, twin prime conjecture, of course, is verified by computer up to four uh, quadrillion places, four into 10 power 18 places. So that much uh, numbers were verified. And when people worked on computers, they verified up to four quadrillion places. There are, in fact, uh, twin primes, but still that is not sufficient for proving that there are infinitely many primes. So coming to the second most important thing, this list is not exhaustive, but these are all problems which I like my, uh, to my mind. Of course, there are preferences for every person. And uh, these problems were somewhat easier to state for the general audience. But because there are some open problems that were very, very hard to even understand. So I, I rejected such problems. I was collecting problems which are quite easy to understand, comprehend, and then probably give an idea of how far it has been solved now and who has uh, trying to solve them and what is the current status of the problem. Somewhat uh, good thing that you can understand because there are some problems which are very hard to even uh, understand the given statement and therefore it is difficult for us to think about it later. Now, uh, Goldbach conjecture uh, was named after Goldbach, who wrote a letter in 1742 to the then the most important mathematician called Euler. Of course, Euler is even today considered to be the most uh, greatest among all uh, mathematicians ever lived on this planet. Okay, uh, Leonard Euler is considered to be the master of everyone. Okay, now, um, he wrote a letter and then he said some statement which was uh, probably assuming that one is a prime number. Goldbach assumed that one is a prime number and he wrote some observation here which you can see it here. So he decomposed any number with, by one also. So one of course is not prime in modern area. In those times some mathematicians took one as a prime number. Okay. Then Euler immediately corrected it and uh, resent a letter to uh, Goldbach stating this theorem. So this was refined by Euler, not the original statement by Goldbach. Euler said that your statement should be refined, redefined like this. And he sa said that every even integer greater than two is sum of two primes. So um, of course, two, you cannot write a sum of two prime because uh, two is the least prime, num uh, prime number. Therefore, there's no possibility of decomposing two into smaller primes. So, in, but you can write 4 as 2 plus 2, you can write 6, for example, as uh, 3 plus 3. So, every even number greater than 2 is sum of 2 primes. Those 2 primes need not be distinct. They can be equal like 3 plus 3 or 2 plus 2 or something. Okay. And the other uh, conjecture that Euler got from uh, Goldbach writings is this, every odd integer greater than 5 is a sum of 3 primes. As you can easily verify, like if you take 7, for example, you can write it as 2 plus 2 plus 3. Okay, if you take 9, you can write decompose it. This is a very easy task, actually. 9 is 3 plus 3 plus 3, sum of 3 primes. So it may not be distinct. The number that you take may not be distinct, of course. 
Now, this is called strong conjecture and this is called weak conjecture because uh, if one proves strong conjecture, strong conjecture implies weak conjecture. That means if I can show that every even integer greater than two sum of two primes, then that will immediately prove that every odd integer greater than five is sum of three primes. This will follow, weak conjecture will follow from strong conjecture. Now, people were trying to solve both of these conjectures and this is again uh, uh, around 280 years old as of now because this was, as I told you, conjectured in the year 1742. So we are 280 years, 279 years right from the year when it was first proposed. Now, if you take these numbers here, you can see uh, this is a pictorial representation of Goldbach's strong conjecture. Some uh, may refer to this uh, because the sum of two prime, this is called Goldbach binary conjecture, binary for two. And the second weak conjecture is also termed as uh, Goldbach ternary conjecture because of three. So this is sometimes called ternary conjecture. This is sometimes called binary conjecture. Okay. So if you take the binary conjecture, this is a pictorial representation like four. See, we have written primes on either side of this uh, number triangle. Four is two plus two. So intersection of four lies in the intersection of two and two. So this dot here. So four is two plus two. You can see six, every even number greater than two, which means four, six, eight, ten. Okay. So six is actually three plus three. So six lies in the intersection of this three as well as this three. Whereas if you take eight, eight lies in the intersection of three and five. So five is here and three is here. So only one way you can write eight as sum of two primes. Whereas these two dots indicate that you can write 10 as sum of two primes in two ways. One way is five plus five. So this five is here, this five is here, five plus five. The other way is seven plus three or three plus seven, whatever way. So these two dots indicate that you can write 10 as sum of two primes in two possible ways. But you can write 12 in only one possible way, which is sum of five and seven. Sum of two primes, that is Goldbach conjecture. Whereas you can write 14 as sum of two ways, but the problem with, uh, I mean, it's easy to see how things work in numbers of smaller magnitude, but if you take larger numbers with somewhat bigger magnitude, you see there are quite a number of ways. For example, 42 can be written as sum of two primes in four possible ways. And if you take 48, it has five different representations as sum of two primes. And therefore, since you know, some of representation become more for larger numbers, it is quite difficult for mathematicians to comprehend uh, and improving uh, as much as possible. But thanks to some people who had been working on this tirelessly, we know something about it, which I will share with you. Uh, in fact, uh, the people believe that the weak conjecture or ternary conjecture had been proved recently. This is a very recent proof. Uh, it was, uh, you can see the paper, this paper, the ternary conjecture, Goldbach conjecture is true. This was published in the year 2014. Uh, you can look out for the paper in this uh, link. Okay. It is available in the archive, uh, org, which is a collection of many good papers in, in mathematics. This is a source for many mathematical papers. Okay. Now, the ternary Goldbach conjecture is true. It was uh, proved by this proof was going to help uh, God. But some people, very few of them, still got doubt in it. And it was not, though it was accepted and published, it was not. Uh, published in the main journal or annals of mathematics because uh, some people still suspect something in it. But most probably very widely it was uh, believed that the weak conjecture has been proved by help God. It was seen as one of uh, great breakthroughs in this century. Now the next thing that is Beale's conjecture. Uh, see, of course, to explain Beale's conjecture, we have to know a bit about Fermat's conjecture, like Fermat's last theorem in particular. Uh, this uh, French mathematician, Perry de Fermat, wrote this marginal note, uh, which is in Latin term, uh, cubum, autumn, in divorce cubos, and other things in Latin, which means that it is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes. That is, it is not possible for us to write a cube number as sum of two cubes or a fourth power number as sum of two fourth powers. In general, any higher power, more than two, can be written as a similar uh, two, pow uh, two powers. Like you can't write a power k as sum of b power k plus c power k when a, b, c are integers, whenever k is greater than two. Or a power n plus b power n is not equal to, or x power n plus y power n is not equal to z power n whenever n is greater than two. 
of course uh, this restriction is simply given because when n is 2 you have infinitely many triples like x y z satisfying and that those triples are called pythagorean triples because we have many uh, this equation to be true whenever n is 2 because we know that 3 square plus 4 square is 5 square 5 square plus 12 square is 13 square so whenever n is 2 you get your usual pythagorean triple but there are no triples x y z for which they satisfy this whenever of course x y z are integers if they're non integers of course we can find a solution but when assuming that x y z are integers and this was called uh, very famously called fermat's last theorem and this mathematic mischievous ferma could have written the last line here uh, like hans merlinus exactus non corpet which means i have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this assertion which is margin is too narrow to contain i know the proof but unfortunately this margin which i am writing this note a marginal note is too narrow to contain so people got excited after seeing this marginal note by ferma this marginal note of ferma became one of classic uh, lines in the history of mathematics ever since it was written in 1637 and finally due to the efforts of uh, several mathematicians ending with andrew wiles this got proved in the year 1994 when a small error was rectified at that time. Uh, then Andrew Wiles worked with the student Richard Taylor to rectify the small error. And finally, the proof was accepted in the year 1995. So Fermat's last theorem has been proved now. That is one of the big theorem that has been proved in the last century. Okay. Now, this man, Andrew Beale, uh, this man named B was a notorious mathematician. I mean, he was mainly a businessman who, whom I whom profile when I checked in the internet. He was one of the billionaires in America and in fourth list he comes around 67th place in the billionaires list in America as of uh, now. So he owns nearly 8 billion US dollars of uh, company. He runs a big bank. So that's called Beale Bank in his name. And uh, this businessman interestingly post a conjecture which was um, considered to be more generalized case of uh, Fermat's uh, last theorem like he said that this is the main statement that he proposed and uh, this is given to, for better understanding these two are equal actually the equation a power x plus b power y is c power that is sum of x power of an integer plus y power of integer cannot be equal to the z power of an integer so the difference between Fermat's last theorem and this theorem, they are one and same looking at the, the, this x, y, z are replaced by a, b, c. But uh, in Fermat's last theorem, you have same equal powers, like like powers, all raised to the same power. But here the powers are different. What Beale said was, even Fermat's last theorem can be extended not only to like powers, it is also true for unlike powers. Like one to the x, x the power, the other to the y the power, the other to the z power. The powers are different and if they are at least three, then this equation has no solution. Mathematicians, with the help of supercomputers and programming skills, were working uh, for many years to identify such a. Uh, and he offered some prize also in 1997 for anyone who come up, uh, across this. Uh, at that time, it was around five thousand dollars. And he said that uh, as years pass by, every for every year of passing, the prize money will increase by five thousand US dollars subsequently. And uh, until 2010, when American Mathematical Society deposited the amount, uh, now the current status of price money is 1 million US dollars, which was kept by AMS. And the interest of that amount until it was claimed was used for Adish Memorial Lecture. So I will talk about Adish a little later. Okay. So uh, people were trying to come up with this kind of equations, but unfortunately, one of the powers is at least two, not more than two. Beale's conjecture says that all this power number, that the exponents should be at least three, not two. But so far, whatever example that they have found contains at least one power of two here. At least a square has come here. And more than two, you can't find this. So Beale's conjecture seems to be true, but no one has proved it so far. So this is another example that you need not require great skills for making a good guess like conjectures like this, because Beale is not a I mean, technically a mathematician, he was an amateur mathematician. So this notice was given by American Mathematical Society website and other things that I said now. Okay. So the price money is, as I told you, is, is 1 million US dollars. So those who can prove Beale's conjecture is still open now. 
if you can prove it it is well and good you can you, you become instantly famous and not only that you can claim 1 million US dollars prize money and collapse conjecture is one of my very favorite open problem i always present this everywhere and uh, this man is collapse who made this conjecture in the year probably 1936 or 37 if i remember correctly 1930s uh, he said that you take a number natural number if it's even, you divide it by two. If it is odd, you multiply by three and add one to it. If you keep on doing this. Ultimately, you will end up with a cycle four to one. This is what you end up with. So for example, when I start with 10, 10 is an even number. Because it's even number, you have to divide by two. So 10 divided by two is five. Because it's odd number. If the answer is an odd number, use this formula. The answer is even number, use this formula. So same function defined in two parities. If the number is odd, you use this rule. If the number is even, use this rule. 5 is an odd number. So 3 times 5 is 15 added to 1. 3n plus 1. This is n for me. So 3 times 5 is 15 add to, added to 1 is become 16. This is an even number. So I divide by 2 by the first uh, parity rule. So 16 by 2 is 8. 8 is an even number. So divide by 2. You get 4. 4 is an even number. So divide by 2. You get 2. 2 is an even number. Divide by 2. You get 1. But 1 is an odd number now. So I have to use this particular rule. Multiply 1 by 3 and add 1 to it. You get back 4. So once you reach 4 to 1, it just becomes a cycle. You get 4 to 1, 4 to 1. So the, the last three numbers, but wherever you start, will always end with 4 to 1. This is what this collage conjecture is about. He claimed that for any starting number, a uh, natural number, you always end up with 4 to 1. Okay. Now, this conjecture, uh, incidentally, has been proved to be true, uh, probably up to... Uh, again uh, 300 quadrillion places uh, numbers up to 300 quadrillion numbers it was it has been uh, proved to be true no number has been escaped from this but some numbers of course like if you start with 20 some 19 has a larger sequence and before ending with 4 to 1 and if you take 27 it takes 111 steps to end with 4 to 1 so for some numbers like 10 you end up four to with four to one immediately. For some numbers it's quite uh, lengthy, but some numbers like I have listed those numbers. This numbers have more length compared to any of the previous numbers. In that sense, these are record setters for having large cycles in collapse conjecture problem. Okay, so after twenty seven, the next largest cycle number is fifty four, and then seventy three. So if, if you start with ninety seven, probably it takes more time. It takes more than hundred steps to end with four to one. But you're sure enough to end with 4 to 1. That is what the conjecture says. Okay. So and this is a more larger picture. As you can see, if you start with this number here, so maybe if I start with 106 here, being even number, dividing by 2, it is 53. 53 means odd number. So 53 times 3 plus 1 is 160. So I come here. 160 is an even number. So divided by 2 is 80. 80 divided by 2 is 40, 20, 10. 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So I, I ultimately end up with 1. So it doesn't matter wherever you start, you follow this uh, path here given by this uh, thing, you ultimately end up with this numbers. Okay. And end up with 4, 2, 1. And after 1, you again go to 4, then it, it is 2, it is 1, as said by Collas conjecture. So even after verifying for that many big numbers, people could not show probably that this is so for all numbers. In fact, Paul Addish. Uh, used to say that mathematics is not yet ready to prove such results. And in fact, this forms a base for what is called dynamical systems, which has uh, very great applications. But it's quite uh, surprising that such a simple rule has created a wonderful result, uh, which uh, keep mathematicians at bay. They cannot prove that uh, beginning with any number, you always end up with 4 to 1, this cycle. I don't know. I mean, I mean, in spite of a huge amount of research done by many people throughout the globe. So this is one of the good unsolved problem and people try to extend this to complex numbers. Now, if, if you construct this complex function like Z by 2, Z by 2, remember, is, is the generalization of N by 2. Whenever N is even, it's N by 2. And whenever N is odd, it is 3N plus 1. So extending this to complex numbers, for N by 2, I took Z by 2. For 3n plus 1, I took uh, 3z plus 1. And when you, you multiply by this by cos square pi z by 2, and you multiply for the odd case with sine square pi z by 2, you get this beautiful picture. 
So this picture is graph of this complex valued function. And you can see this is one that that portion. Every wherever you start, you come to this portion, you come to this portion, you come to this portion. Finally, you come to this portion. It doesn't matter wherever you start, you always come to this middle portion. You, probably even if you start here through this line, you can come here. Through. This is a, a fractal picture resembling this two dimensional picture here for natural numbers. Okay. Now, the next problem that I want to discuss with you is called uh, sunflower conjecture. I dedicate this particular talk uh, to this man whose birthday was day before yesterday. I always admire this uh, great man called Paul Addish, who, uh, who was well known to research mathematical people because he is the one who has published more than 1500 research papers, original papers. And of course, he lived in the, from the period 1983 to 1996. For 83 years, he was alive. He was a very recent mathematician who passed away precisely 25 years ago. Um, so uh, he has been to India on a couple of occasions or I mean some occasions, not exactly known, but I know that he has been to India several times. And he is a man who was uh, who originated the probabilistic uh, graph theory, who was considered to be king of numbers. And uh, he traveled throughout the globe uh, without uh, he never had a permanent job he never had anything with him he never had a home for a shelter uh, i mean never cared about worldly positions such a great man okay and uh, this sunflower conjecture was proposed by paul addish and uh, rado these two people so this, uh, this is a real sunflower picture and uh, they define sunflower conjecture through this idea you take uh, non-empty sets, maybe how many sets you want, you can take. Like I'm taking three non-empty sets here and uh, list out those elements here. So the elements of A are 1, 2, 3, 4. Elements of B are 1, 3, 5, 7. Elements of C are 1, 3, 9, 27. Now this middle portion is intersection of all the sets. And this middle portion, intersection of all the three sets. As you can see here, 1 and 3 are common to all the three sets. So intersection of all the sets A, B, C will be 1, 3. They defined this common intersection portion as kernel, kernel of, uh, just like kernel of a homomorphism or something in the group theory or in algebra. This is kernel for the sunflower. So this, uh, the remaining elements are resembling the petals of a sunflower. Okay, they are the petals of sunflower. This is called the kernel, the common intersection portion. And for this particular five sets, and you can see, the, the length of the petals may differ. That is what actually you see in a real sunflower, actually. The, the length of the petal may not be same. For some flowers, it might be same like this, but for generally, it, it may not be the same. So uh, keeping this in mind, they had uh, uh, given this particular name called sunflower. Now, what is about this conjecture? Uh, they published uh, a theorem in 1960. If you have at least this many sets w factorial into r minus 1 to the power w sets each with uh, maximum of w numbers then there must be a sunflower with r petals so this uh, number of sets will guarantee you to get a sunflower with r petals okay now what they suggested is they thought that this number of sets is very huge because w factorial becomes huge when W is large, isn't it? Factorials grow very, very uh, high as you take numbers. I mean, it's a very quickly diverging factor. Okay, so W factorial increases rapidly more than compared to any other uh, proper polynomial function, and therefore they thought that you can find a constant C for which this margin, this bound of number of sets, can be reduced to the term C power W. And uh, recently. There were many people who have been working down uh, to find the constant C so that this upper bone margin of sets proposed by addition could be reduced to this form. Now, a recent paper, and now here, this example is quite interesting. People might think that you may take sets where there is no intersection at all. So this is a mathematical sunflower, not a real sunflower. A real sunflower may not be looking like this because you need some portion here to hold all the petals, isn't it? The middle portion. In a real sunflower, you need this portion to hold all the petals together. But in mathematical sunflower, it may not be the case. You may not find uh, uh, the intersection portion at all. If the sets are disjoint sets like this, 
this is a mathematical sunk flow. In that sense, the sunk flow defined by those two people were more general than compared to the usual sunk flow that you see in nature. Okay. Now, uh, several people suggested different bonds, but the recent uh, beautiful, uh, after this, there was not much work. Of course, the one work came in uh, 1997, 37 years after this uh, conjecture was proposed, but that was not a very drastic improvement. But the recent uh, work uh, by this people, this four authors, which was published in year 2020, very recently, uh, exactly a year back, one year back, they suggested that C can be log W. See, the rate of log W is very slow compared to W factorial. Okay, so people who know analysis very well know that log N uh, diverges to infinity very, very slow compared to N, and N is very small compared to N factorial. So this factor is what they suggested. As you can see in the abstract, they could have written here. They proposed that the, the C can be taken as log W. So, so even this goes to infinity when W is large, but the rate at which this factor going to infinity, uh, diverging to infinity, is much, much smaller than this. So this is practically useful for considering or constructing a sunflower with R petals. So this is a very good proof. And you can find this paper in this uh, link. It is uh, available for free download. So wherever possible, I'm giving the sources to you and the paper itself for your convenience and understanding. The next problem that I will be discussing is called kissing number problem. Don't take in the wrong sense. This is uh, touching, kissing in the sense touching of objects. Okay. Now, um, there are two possible circles here. Uh, how many points that they can touch when we, we take two objects like this? If I take a rod and take another rod, they touch at one point. This is in one dimensional case. The circle is in two dimension, but if I take two rods and, or uh, small strings with negligible thickness, they touch at one point like this. So one point of intersection for one dimension. For two dimension, if you take a circle, of course, you have to take objects with same radius, same size rather, okay? Not different sizes. Okay, if you take a circle in two dimension, how many maximum circles that can touch this particular circle? As I said, the circles constructed uh, that you take should be of same size as of the given circle. So for a given circle in two dimension, you can have maximum six possible circles touching it. This is the maximum possible case. Okay, this is in two dimension. Now Kepler, some three to four centuries ago, made a conjecture in three dimension that this number is for two dimension six is called the kissing number for circle in two dimension, and one is a kissing number touching. Kissing means touching here for uh, uh, one dimension. So for one dimension, the kissing number is one because only one point, if, if two objects in one dimension can touch. And maximum point of intersection that people that uh, equal objects can touch a given object like circle is six here as you can see the hexagonal arrangement here so probably this is why honeybees uh, look like hexagonal shape nature knows nature is the best optimizer and it knows how to best optimize itself by constructing the best possible sh shapes that mathematics could predict so that's that's a wonderful thing to see actually nature always choose the best thing okay now in three-dimensional, if you take uh, spheres, how many maximum possible spheres that can touch a given sphere, the red sphere inside? Possibly the other spheres uh, which are in backside of this picture, unless you rotate it, it's not visible. Unfortunately, this is a static picture, not the rotating dynamic picture. And therefore, but I can tell you that the answer is 12. But uh, this was actually conjectured by Kepler. Kepler suggested that uh, there are 12 maximum sphere that can touch a given sphere but people were working very hard for it and uh, including newton tried it but it, uh, it, it went in vain uh, very recently around 1998 thomas hales from uh, america uh, proved that there are in fact 12 spheres and of course he used a computer aided proof for this just like four color problem was was put four color conjecture and a very famous problem in graph theory was proved by using computers Similarly, Thomas Hales used computer aided the proof to prove that there are indeed 12 spheres which can touch as a maximum space. So the kissing number in three dimensional is 12. Now, these are the bounds. Now, people in four dimension using uh, leech latex, which exists in four, 24 dimensions, they proved that in four dimension, there are maximum 12, 24 uh, intersections that can one can make. in if you take a sphere in four dimension, for example, 
24 spheres can be accommodated surrounding it that forms actually a, a lattice called a leech lattice and it exists in 24 dimensions so they proved that there are 24 maximum possible spheres that can touch an object in four dimension but but uh, uh, we know the answer even for eight dimension for eight dimension uh, there are 240 maximum spheres that can touch and for 24 dimensions again for 24 up to 24 dimensions that we know is uh, 196560 objects can touch this is an enormous number isn't it uh, nearly 2 lakhs here so this people had been working on but for the other cases apart from this cases like one dimension two dimension three dimension four dimension eight dimension and 24 dimensions the other cases is uh, yet to get resolved but they they had proved some lower bounds and upper bound in five dimension the kissing number is somewhere between 40 and 44 it cannot be less than 40 and more than 44 in six dimension it cannot be less than 72 and more than 78 so these are all lower bounds and upper bounds and you can see uh, the work of this in published in ams notices of american mathematical society in this paper a very good uh, article written about this kissing number and the next problem that i want to tell you is about unknotting problem i mean theory of knots has been a very uh, i mean study of great importance in recent years and it has direct connections with uh, mathematical biology as well as uh, in dynamical systems where people try to interact how molecules in chemical kinetics interact with one another uh, just it is wonder uh, that uh, how our ancient people used to uh, very casually do all this uh, tying and untying things like knotting and unknotting what mathematicians call it uh, so these things were done effortlessly by our elders but it was studied mathematically in recent years it's not a very ancient topic like number theory or geometry uh, it has been emerged only a few maybe a century back or so but people have been studying the main problem in knotting theory or not theory of knots is that if you these are all possible types of knots we want to know whether a given type of knot can be unknotted that is uh, it can have so many knots in it whether it can be it is possible to unknot it and make it like a, like this like a circle or something where it has no knot any unknotted object is i mean if there are not uh, knots it is called an unknot here like this a simple knot uh, this this has two knots here one is here another one is here it's, uh, these are all types of knots which has direct connection to algebraic varieties in group theory and uh, the main problem is to identify the types of knots i mean which type of knots are equal to one another and uh, among those three knots which i can uh, unknot and keep it to simple like this which i can unknot and bring it to like this form uh, maybe the answer is very difficult unless you know how to identify it in terms of knot theory and there was a big idea given by jones and it's called jones polynomial there's a polynomial called jones polynomial which is helpful to identify when a knot can be identified and there are many theorems that establishes isomorphism between two types of knot whether which says that this whether these two knots can be unknotted to the same position or these two knots are isomorphic to each other or something like that like how we study isomorphism between groups or rings or fields you have isomorphism uh, between two knots okay so one classic example is this this is the uh, the two-dimensional version of this three-dimensional knot so if i take this first knot given in picture a i can move it smoothly i can just pull it away so that it becomes an unknot now this the second type this, this one this is the third picture this knot is from uh, the second knot here what i can do is this is a possible operation in, in making this operation to become unknot you are not supposed to cut the th object i mean if this is a rope for example you are not supposed to cut the rope but you can pull it you can untie it you can push it here you can pull it you can translate it you can rotate it you can do something like that but you are not supposed to cut the object so that is that operation is not possible but you can overturn it you can rotate it of course so what i'm going to do is in the first case is uh, the uh, the knot lying above here is interchanged to below and below is interchanged above so that this orientation is same as this orientation this part is above here this part is above therefore you can pull it and, like this and then you can twist it to make it unknotted so geometrically because this position as well as this position can be reduced to unknot 
I can say that these two knots are isomorphic because they both can be resolved to a knot form. So this kind of what kind of operations are allowed, and uh, uh, I mean what kind of you can associate a polynomial to identify uh, two particular knots and classify them. These ideas are available in knot theory. Uh, there were there are many good literature and many good books available on theory of knots. I would advise those who are interested. And this site is also a very good site for knowing more about knots, and it contains more beautiful pictures about knots. So those who are interested can go and look at this. Okay. The next uh, thing that I want to tell you is about moving sofa problem. I mean, usually uh, we, we we I mean it's not only really confined to sofa, but a, a court like this where we usually uh, take rest and any object a table for example when we want to when we are shifting a home or our residence uh, we probably get some difficulty usually in, in moving removing this bureaus and uh, cot and other big things especially because the gateway the hallway uh, is a rectangular shape like this okay so it turns like this short turn like this usually the hallway so this uh, moser in 1966 Ask this question: What is the shape of largest area in the plane that can be moved around a right angle? So we wanted to identify the shape on the objects which can slide easily without difficulty, such that it has maximum area. Supposing if I take a square of unit length, just for example, you can translate it like this. This is a translation. Push it here. You can slide it here, and once it comes to this particular corner, you can push it down. So uh, you can do this operation here in moving. Uh, from one room to another room or pull it out from the uh, residence okay if, if your object is a square but unfortunately this has area of only one because i'm taking uh, a square of side length one so its area is one okay now people are working to find uh, an object of maximum area as i told you supposing if you take a semicircle of radius uh, uh, one for example see a circle of radius one has uh, area pi because pi r square r is one here because it is a semicircle of radius one the area is, is pi by two a semicircle can be moved here it can be tilted once it comes to this position and then it can be slided down so this area is pi by two here so people had no idea about what could be the best possible uh, shape and pi by two is approximately 1.57 because pi is 3.14 approximately and this 1.57 number is uh, more than one in square shape so the semicircle shape when you of the object is much better because it gives an area of, uh, which is 0.57 greater than the square shape portion this area is just one but this area is 0.57 uh, 1.57 which is 0.57 more than the first case but no one is sure what kind of best possible shape is this people are working uh, through computers to design several objects here now this man in 1968 two years after Moser posed this problem constructed this object. This object consists of uh, shape like you get a rectangle in the middle here and you cut a semicircle here. This radius is between 0 to 1. He said that the radius can be any number between 0 to 1. And this is another uh, big, uh, big circle. This is portion of a circle cut into half and then choose a radius between 0 to 1 and cut this semicircle. This probably looks like more of a, this is a straight line segment. So you, you have to not a circle here. This is a straight line segment here. So put a rectangle over here. This probably resembles like a old uh, telephone uh, thing. I mean, hand handset of a telephone, the older telephone, the landline one. Okay. So resembling that uh, handset of a telephone. Now, if you take this particular object and if you try to move this uh, in the right angle corner, it will have an area of pi by 2 plus 2 by pi. So for the want of time, I'm just giving the expressions. This is the maximum possible area for this shape. It works out to 2.2074 or something. It's not visible for me here. Okay. And then um, in 1992, uh, Gerber uh, created this shape. This is almost similar to the previous shape, but there's a sharp corner here. The, the sharp corner was uh, changed to this corner. And the straight line segment length of the straight line segment was little reduced compared to this uh, segment here so making some small rearrangements Gerber could find an object whose area of, of moving the sofa this turns out to be two point uh, how much is this it's not visible for me here it is actually a little bit more comparatively little bit more not very much i think it's 2.21 something uh, 
Uh, so if you work out the difference between these two models here, this area and that area, it, it turns out to be 0 0.0121. So approximately only 1.2% different between the model proposed by Hammersley as well as Germ Gerber. But still it is a very uh, good improvement and no one so far has found any good shape which has more area than this particular shape proposed by Gerber. In fact, this was uh, recently approved in the year 1992 by Gerber in this uh, Springer paper on moving the sofa around the corner. This is again available in the, uh, not available, you, you, it's a paid paper. So the abstract I had given here, so I could not get the whole paper. It's not free access paper here. Now the other mathematicians were trying to create a possible shape with not just one corner, right angle corner, but what happened to the shape when there are two right angles? That is the object should turn right here and then to the left. If there are two turnings to the right here and to the left. If there are two possible turnings. What could be the shape with maximum possible area to slide down to these two right angle corners? It turns out that this mathematician, Dan Romick, did a great work, uh, I mean, keeping with this. So he worked out uh, many shapes and ultimately ended up with this particular shape. This is a very curious shape that he found. This was very recently done in April 2016. He showed that area of this particular shape turns out to be sum of two values, namely x plus tan inverse y, where x is root of this equation, real root of this equation, and y is root of this particular equation. It turns out that x is this number, and, and tan inverse y is this particular number. When you add these two, you get approximately 1.6449, uh, 1.65, uh, rather approximately and no one could do better than this and people i mean we are not sure whether you can improve upon this so this still remain as an open problem so the best possible uh, possible shape that we have found so far is this but no one is sure whether you can improve upon it people are still working on this very curiously and uh, riemann hypothesis is considered to be the uh, holy grail of all mathematics any active working mathematician as of today would, would dream to solve this particular problem this is a problem from complex analysis. And if you take a zeta function proposed by Euler, this function, zeta function proposed by Euler, is sum of reciprocals of uh, the sth power of reciprocals of natural numbers, like 1 power s, 1 by 1 power s plus 1 by 2 power s plus 1 by 3 power s, and so on. This, this is called zeta function. When you take s to be real numbers, it's called the Euler zeta function, whereas if you uh, Riemann uh, refined it by taking s. Uh, to complex number of the form sigma plus uh, it or alpha plus i beta however you call it when s is a complex number it's called riemann zeta function and he said that all the non-trivial zero trivial zeros are known to be the ones which are negative even integers like minus two minus four minus six minus eight these are all trivial zeros of this the points where this function becomes zero and then what riemann suggested to everyone's surprise in a paper in 1859 was this actually he said that all the non-trivial zeros, apart from this zeros, will lie on the critical uh, line. This strip is called critical strip between 0 and 1. And this particular line where uh, the zeros of the zeta function lies is called critical line. You, you, there's no one who could find uh, any zero beyond this critical, either to the left of it or to the right of it. So far, no one has found it. As well as uh, no one could prove either that all the zeros of uh, zeta function lie on the critical line. Okay, so this was still an unsolved problem. This was considered to be the, the most uh, difficult as well as the best unsolved problem that exists in all of mathematics today, named after Riemann. I mean, Riemann was a genius of, um, of all mathematicians. And uh, recently, in uh, April of last year, uh, people were trying to verify this Riemann hypothesis for as many numbers as possible. And this man, uh, Dave Platt, had written a paper. Okay, this was available in the internet. You can just type this, you can get it. The Riemann hypothesis is true up to three trillion places. So, though we know that this result is true for, so the, which means up to three trillion zeros that has been discovered for the non trivial zero that we discovered for uh, zeta function. All the non-trivial zeros up to three trillion zeros all lie as predicted by Riemann. All lie in the, the critical line. That means they have uh, real part, half imaginary part, some particular numbers. 
all the interestingly they all lie in the straight line because the real part is half so this straight line has an equation of half plus it for some t the real part of this line is half imaginary part is some number so it's a beautiful alignment and the, the most important thing that makes riemann hypothesis very special is because most of the hundreds of results depends on the truth of riemann hypothesis in other words if someone could prove riemann hypothesis then they eventually can prove all the rest of the theorems which depend on this important theorem that is first important thing the second important thing about riemann hypothesis is that um, it answers the distribution of primes so once riemann hypothesis has been proved we know how primes are distributed in the number line so so with this two aspects riemann hypothesis is said to be so important considered to be the the most wanted problem unsolved problem in mathematics any mathematician would dream of uh, proving this so and uh, there was some list of seven problems made by uh, clay mathematical institute recently in 2000 uh, 2000 in fact was the year 2000 was declared as world mathematical year and in that year clay mathematical institute organized seven problems unsolved problems in which one has been solved in the year 2003 by gregory perelman that's a special uh, i mean you can you can have a lot of special session for talking about gregory perelman's achievement and life is a very a very important mathematician who not only proved point correct conjecture but rejected the uh, price offered for solving all this problem because each of the seven problems according to clay mathematical institute has uh, price money of 1 million us dollars apart from other prices and uh, uh, benefits that you get in fact not only perelman rejected the 1 million us dollars for proving point correct conjecture but he also rejected the price money from uh, mathematical union imu international mathematical union as well as he rejected the fields medal which was offered to him uh, in the year 2006 in the, the in the icm which was conducted immediately after getting this proof this theorem was proved in the year 2004 finally accepted but he told that uh, equal credit should be given to american mathematician richard hamilton because i was using this result also in proving this is one of very deep theorem proved by this man so if you find such a person who could uh, reject every price uh, because he told that mathematics to me is important not this prices so the the claim is important but we are not working for prices or money or fame or something so uh, that kind of mathematician is very very rare to see in this type of materialistic world the other uh, problems there are seven problems in which one has been proved in millennium problem the other six problems are p versus np i'll give a short uh, quick notice Uh, to decide whether a problem is solvable in in finite i mean in short time or not that answers is p versus np polynomial versus non polynomial time a hodge conjecture is about uh, um, uh, surfaces i mean joining of surfaces and uh, answering about how surfaces can be glued together to form a object of uh, in high dimension riemann hypothesis i said just now uh, riemann hypothesis one of the millennium problems Uh, young mills existence and this is about particle physics and uh, it talks about how particles interact and they talk about a concept called mass gap which which is a, which is very deep actually so you can uh, there's a good book on millennium problem describing all this problem very briefly by keith devlin so those who can afford to go it's a very uh, small book but very good book by keith devlin you can refer that book to understand very clearly about all this problem navy stokes equation is one of good problem because it explains how airplanes the boat traveling in a, it is concerned with fluid dynamics how the turbulence is created how when a boat travels very quickly in sea water how the waves travel and the behavior of such waves and air turbulence has been discussed very deeply by some differential equations in navy the stokes of course is the name stokes is very familiar because he is the one who gave the stokes theorem in vector calculus is yes, that particular man and birch and spinet and dyer conjectures again uh, a deep conjecture about elliptic curves and number theory and other things uh, which shows that there are some though by hilbert's 10th problem says that there is no shortcut procedure or methodical procedure that can be available for solving any given problem but this people said that there are such procedure for special type of problem which are connected to elliptic curves and other special classes of algebraic varieties and uh, that conjecture has not been proved so far so this are all this and uh, you can use this link to uh, to know about this millennium problem in cmi website uh, clay mathematical institute website and each problem carries 1 million us dollars of course except point correct conjecture the rest six are unproved so if you can prove one of this you not only become world fame 
but you can claim that one million US dollars price, apart from Bill's conjecture that I told you. So probably, uh, what before I finish this talk, I used to tell young teachers that you you create some passion and interest with you. Don't start with a very big problem. See, all this problem that I mentioned now are very classical. They are very difficult because this has resisted so many great minds so far. And otherwise, it could have been proven by other mathematicians. Isn't it? They could not have come across this many decades or this many centuries or even millennium until it, they get solved. So they are not so easy problems. But there are always scope for us to start with the elementary problem and then work on it, work on it, do some active research on it, and then so try to solve this. I mean, if you take any great mathematician like Terence Stowe or other people, they do some research at a basic level first, and then they concentrate on big problem using the basic things that they have done. So uh, this is just uh, this collection again is not an exhaustive collection. These are my favorite problem that I like most in unsolved problem. Most often I used to present only pictures so that people may get some feeling about what we are saying rather than writing down uh, so many formulas and uh, steps. Uh, mathematically, which creates some kind of uneasiness to them. Uh, so pictures, conveying facts with pictures is one of the best methods that I like most. So what little I know I had presented to you, it is up to you to choose choose, choose simple from those who wish to do research, choose uh, problems according to what you like, choose simple of them, and then create some basic ideas in it. Do you finish your research first and then try to uh, resolve this kind of difficult problem if you come up well it's well and good you attain world fame even if you are not you can very often find out some other uh, idea so that you can make some good papers on it so uh, doing research itself is a big experience it's an enriching experience with that uh, this uh, i can complete my talk i thank everyone for supporting and giving this opportunity to present what little i know before you thank you thank you sir Dear participants, any question? Dear participants, any question? You can ask. Dear participants? Dear participants, oh. you can ask. You can ask. You can unmute yourself and talk. Hello. Dear participants, any doubt? You can ask. Any query related to this? You can ask. Dear participants, any question? I think I think no question from the audience, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, what of thanks? Jay Shri Krishna. Good afternoon to everyone. It's my privilege to propose a word of thanks speech and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked meticulously to make this FDP happen. On behalf of my department, I extend a hearty thanks to our eminent chief guest, Dr. R. Sivaraman, who spared his valuable time and brilliant ideas and for gracing this occasion. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts, which I am assured will encourage us our future endeavors. Your thoughts have enlightened our minds and have shown us a new path. My gratitude to you, sir, for gracing this occasion and sharing your expertise. Thank you, one and all. And dear participants, one more information. Uh, today, the second session, Dr. S. Sarigarin is going to talk about computational linear algebra. The, sh the session is going to start 3.15. Please make note down. Dear participant, very, very important. The second section is going to start 3.15. Dr. S. Arigaran is going to talk on the topic computational linear algebra. Thank you.
Uh, Ramjeevan sir, do you have any questions to, or you, you raised your hand, do you have any questions to ask? No sir, no, some mistake I have did.
Shama? Yes, sir. You can start 350. Okay. Yeah, warm greetings to all the participants who have joined the seventh day second session of this UGC sponsored seven days virtual faculty development program on aspects of mathematics. It's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. S. Hariharan, Assistant Professor, DG Vaishnav College, Chennai. He completed his postgraduate and MPhil in Madurai Kamraj University. He completed his doctorate in applied mathematics from Florida Institute of Technology, USA. He has three years of research experience at Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, as a research scholar and has more than 15 years of teaching experience at the level of assistant professor and associate professor from VIT University, Amrita University, and currently in DG Vaishnav College. He worked as a programmer analyst for one year in software industry. He was honored with many academic awards, namely Outstanding Student Award and Graduate Student Ass Assistantship Award at Florida Institute of Technology, Research Assistantship and Gates Scholarship Award at Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi, Lectureship Award, CSAR Net, New Delhi, India. He has published more than 15 research papers in reputed national and international journals. With this short introduction, I'm glad to welcome our speaker, Dr. S. Hariharan, to enlighten us today by his talk on computational linear algebra. I hand over this session to you, sir. Thank you, madam, for that introduction. And you, um, I would like to uh, thank the department as well as the HOD for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, the computational linear algebra. As we are into the last session, uh, um, I will uh, focus a few things on uh, what is that uh, uh, I'm going to talk today. So what is the that uh, computational linear algebra? We know linear algebra very well. And what is this uh, computational aspects uh, uh, in linear algebra? So I'm going to give some gist on that and uh, I'm going to show you some kind of uh, animation if possible as well as i will talk about uh, the the uh, feasibility of uh, doing all these things in current day softwares okay so uh, to begin with um, let me share uh, what i have uh, read from these books so one is by gilbert strang uh, a recent book on linear algebra and learning from data it is a wellesley cambridge press um, uh, it is uh, for, uh, in 2019. So this uh, this book talks about uh, uh, the the linear algebra from uh, data point of view. So I will be mostly uh, uh, referencing this book for my for my today's talk. The other book uh, what I, I what I want to mention is that uh, linear algebra and uh, optimization for machine learning is a Springer publication by Charu C Agarwal. Um, here also a lot of uh, algorithms and uh, uh, techniques related to linear algebra and optimization for machine learning is proposed and as well as they implemented a few things. So these two books, uh, I would suggest uh, to, to know more about, uh, more about uh, the implementation of uh, certain things in um, uh, using uh, linear algebra. So what I want is uh, today's, uh, today's world, we are talking about uh, data science and data analytics. So uh, I would like to emphasize uh, the importance of uh, the linear algebra concept in today's uh, world, such that uh, the data science as well as data analytics uses the idea of uh, probability optimization and this uh, linear algebra. Earlier days, if, you, if we see, uh, we were talking about uh, the CFD concept, computer, so, so fluid dynamics, where everything turns out to be a mathematical modeling in terms of a partial differential equation. 
again uh, we will be getting a system of equations to solve them and uh, we were relying on linear algebra concepts to get the solution there so earlier days also linear algebra was playing a bigger role in getting the solution of uh, uh, many problems and uh, today's world also we are actually relying on the concepts of linear algebra uh, to know more about these solutions so so i thought okay we we can talk about uh, computational linear algebra and uh, uh, give some gist on what we are trying to do in today's application okay and those uh, who wants to start with the basic linear algebra uh, we can always go with uh, hoffman and kunz that is the known book uh, at the level of uh, postgraduate level and also david c lay which talks about uh, more uh, problem oriented thing so basic linear algebra can be taken from those two books and uh, these two books uh, talks about the applications of linear algebra in several aspects well so with that uh, focus let me start with uh, what we are uh, really doing in linear algebra so first of all if i look at it uh, uh, there are uh, five concepts here one is like a system of equations the other one is uh, the eigen value problem the third one is uh, av equal to sigma u and uh, fourth one is uh, something like uh, optimization problem and uh, sixth to uh, fifth one is the factorization of the matrix so mathematically if we if we if we see our objective is uh, to find x such that ax equal to b and in the second case it is like identifying the eigen values and the corresponding eigen vectors where we are seeking like ax equal to lambda x and in the third case uh, we try to identify what is uh, v u and sigma and the fourth one is uh, just the optimization problem because it uh, it talks about uh, minimize norm of ax square divided by norm x square and the last one is um, factor the matrix in the sense that we talk about columns times rows well this is uh, from mathematical perspective but if we really see what it is i can i can state my question in a different way is the vector b in the column space of a instead of asking find x such that a x equal to b i am i am reposing my question like is the vector b in the column space of a which means that uh, can i write b in terms of the columns of a it 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 goes down to the linear combination what we have studied in linear algebra the second thing can be taken as like uh, a x keeps the same direction as x so when when i operate a matrix on a vector does it change the direction of the vector or still it is retaining the same direction of the vector x that's what we are asking as the eigen value and the corresponding eigen vectors of a system of equation and where are we using it uh, the concept of uh, e to the power at where uh, it it helps us to solve the system of equations system of differential equations we try to identify what is uh, this e to the power at where a is a matrix the moment we know the corresponding eigen values and eigen vectors it can be easily solved to get solution of uh, system of differential equation which means that it converts that e to the power at into a linear form well the third one the known singular value decomposition problem we try to identify the simplest pieces uh, sigma u v transpose where u will consist of uh, orthogonal vectors as well as v also consist of orthogonal vectors i will talk about this soon and the uh, sigma is nothing but the corresponding singular values which are nothing but the square roots of the eigen values so everything turns out to be like uh, finding eigen values and eigen vectors there so these those pieces are matrices so what I, what i am saying is the the matrices u and b every matrix built from these orthogonal pieces so so the 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 introduction of data science in terms of linear algebra starts with the singular value decomposition where the idea of orthogonality plays a major role and also the and also the concept of eigen values and eigen vectors is uh, naturally there 
to identify certain things. Well, the third one, before getting into that, the same concept of this uh, singular value decomposition is helping us to identify the principal component analysis, which means that if I have huge data set to identify the data which are really playing an important role, this principal component analysis will help us uh, to identify those, those vectors and minimize, or I can say that uh, uh, reduce the dimension uh, uh, to move further. Okay. So this principal component analysis idea also comes from the concept of uh, singular value decomposition. Well, the next two, two things are like uh, minimization and factorization, which expresses the fundamental applied problems. So many a times when we dealt with uh, uh, the problems involving matrices, this factorization of the matrices will make the operations simple. And this minimization problem, naturally it comes when we start thinking uh, uh, to solve a problem in an optimized way. So all optimization problems are either maximizing it or minimizing it. So that is what we are looking at. So these are the uh, five basic things which gives us an idea why linear algebra is so powerful in today's world. Well, so with that little introduction, let me just uh, go with uh, the concepts. So how do we understand all these things in a simple way? As we are talking about uh, the linear combination of columns of A, as well as the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, as well as the orthogonal matrices, and also the factorization. So all these ideas can be captured easily when we understand the column spaces and null spaces and the eigenvectors and singular vectors of a given matrix, which we all know that, well, when I, when I talk about uh, the column space, row space, null space, and the transpose of null space, as well as the eigenvectors, everything comes to our mind like, uh, well, we are actually having a matrix. We try to reduce it to a row space by identifying the pivotal entries, we, we identify the column space and the orthogonal component of this row space can be identified as null space. And once we have all these things, it is, uh, we can think about uh, the corresponding eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And we can take all these things into the applications of like uh, least squares, Fourier transform and lasso in statistics. And uh, we have stochastic gradient method in uh, deep learning with the neural nets. So least square is again going to be a regression problem. So the, the immediate applications are there in all these areas. So all we need is uh, to understand the concept of the column space and row space and null space of a given matrix. If we have that understanding, these things will become so simple and the tools what we are trying to identify will become more powerful to get the solution of a given problem. So in that way, Instead of starting uh, linear algebra with vector space and subspace and other things, if uh, somebody can start with the idea of uh, 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 taking a matrix and uh, try to identify the row space, column space of it using the Gaussian, uh, the, the row re reduced echelon form. And then if somebody talks about uh, the corresponding basis and the linear independence and all, that gives a different perspective of uh, linear algebra in terms of teaching. So, how different it is from the regular way of doing our linear algebra. Okay, let us uh, just start with uh, something on the matrix vector multiplication. Well, we all know that uh, the, 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 when we multiply a matrix with a vector, what we do is we normally take the um, rows of the given matrix, and then multiply with this uh, the column. Okay, so when you do the row times column, naturally it becomes like a two x one plus three x two. So which we can think of like uh, doing the inner product. Okay, using the idea of inner product, we can do the uh, matrix time vector multiplication. Well, the same thing if we just do this way. Instead of uh, uh, using the inner product concept, 
we try to do the same thing in a different way. Take this as a linear combination of these two scalars, x1 and x2, by taking the columns of the given matrix. So matrix vector multiplication can be done using columns also by considering x1 times the first column plus x2 times the second column. So combinations of the columns of the given matrix. If I say the matrix has the columns as A1 and A2, so what I'm trying to see is that X1 times A1 plus X2 times A2, which becomes the linear combination of the columns of the given matrix. So what could be the corresponding, corresponding advantage? So when we do the inner product thing, we all know that we can get the result immediately. But when we talk about the linear combination, we are just thinking of expressing the matrix vector multiplication using the concept of linear combination. So whenever we talk about the linear combination, we can think of like multiplying the columns A1, A2 by scalars X1, X2 and add them together to get the corresponding AX, which is nothing but operating the matrix A on the given vector X. So any matrix operation on a vector, we can express it as a linear combination of columns of A. So this is what uh, the fundamental idea about all those uh, five things, what I was talking about initially, like uh, solving a system or solving eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and then going for minimization of a given problem or the singular value decomposition or the matrix factorization. So when we take a matrix, take that as like a column space, which are linearly. So column vectors, which are linearly independent. If we have that idea, many of these things like a singular value decomposition or principal component analysis or the matrix factorization will become so simple in terms of understanding. Well, so the same thing, when I say like uh, take a matrix A and multiply with the x, the result is going to be the same. And the moment uh, if I talk about whether uh, am I working in 2D or 3D, immediately I can say that because this expression in the right hand side, we are talking about the linear combination of two th three dimensional vectors. So immediately I can say that because this is a linear combination of vectors in 3D, we are in uh, R3 and it is a three dimensional vector. And uh, the moment I, I ensure that A1 and A2 are linearly independent, I can say that it is going to fill the infinite plane containing the lines. One is of uh, this direction, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3. Other one is of this direction, 3, 4, 7, provided I prove my linear independence of these two column vectors. So, so I can immediately say that uh, the resultant combination produces a plane in R3 which contains the lines in the direction of 2, 2, 3 and 3, 4, 7. So this is the idea behind uh, representing anything in terms of the column space. And we all know that the combinations of uh, the columns fill out the column space of A and uh, any vector is in the column space of A when exactly AX equal to B satisfied. And we can say that it has a solution X1 comma x2 and uh, for for just a matter of uh, a matter of uh, uh, completeness what i am giving is um, it is not necessary that we should always get a solution for any given b there are problems where it is unsolvable also so in that way we will say that uh, column space of a is just giving you all the possible solutions and the, the moment B is not in the column space of A, we can immediately say that it is unsolvable. That's all it is. Well, when we talk about uh, R3, what could be the corresponding subspaces? We can say that, well, zero vector itself will form a subspace. And if I have only one vector, then I can say that it is going to be a line of all vectors in the direction um, of the first column vector A1. So linear, so I can say that the scalar multiple of uh, 
the corresponding vector will give you all the points on the line. So x1, a1 represents a line of all vectors, x1, a1. And also the subspace could be like a plane of all vectors, which actually has uh, two linearly independent columns of a, a1 and a2. And all the linear combination will, will, um, uh, will cover that plane, which contains the vectors uh, lines a1 and a2. And the space itself, or three itself, will be the subspace of itself. And what we need is uh, this a1, a2, a3 to be linearly independent. The moment I guarantee the linear independence, immediately I can talk about uh, the inverse of the given matrix such that a, a inverse equal to a inverse a equal to identity matrix. And, uh, and uh, once the inverse exists, I can say that uh, the homogeneous system ax equal to zero, zero requires x to be equal to 0, 0, 0. And x can be calculated using the inverse of the matrix x equal to a inverse b. All these becomes our regular concept on solving the system of equations. Well, so with that understanding, let me go further into the rank and uh, the other things with respect to the row echelon form. So if I have uh, a as uh, a three by three matrix, and by getting into the row echelon form, immediately I can say that the rank of the matrix is two, and the third column can be written as the linear combination of first two columns, and hence uh, rank is uh, less than the number of rows in a given matrix. And uh, for the second one, we can see that uh, the column space also always it is equal to the given original matrix, and hence I can guarantee that the inverse exists for that. And the third case, the rank is one, and whereas there are three columns in the original matrix A, the here, the number R is the dimension of the column space of A and C. Well, so what connects this A and C? What really it is? We all know that uh, for a given matrix, we can go for the elementary row operations to get the corresponding corresponding reduced row echelon form. Once we get the reduced row echelon form, we can actually go for the corresponding row space of the given matrix. So using the row space and the column space, using the row space and the column space, so these are the vectors from the row spaces, and these are the corresponding columns from the column space, then when I multiply these two, I can always get the corresponding A matrix here. I can always get the corresponding matrix A. So any given matrix can be represented in terms of its row space and the column space here. So this is the corresponding row reduced a column form of A. And similarly, I can say that when I have A as this, when I go for the reduced row echelon form, I can see that uh, this is the vector in the row space and this is the corresponding vector in the column space. So when I multiply these two, I can always get the matrix A. So if you, if you recollect, we, will, we are trying to express A in terms, in terms of its columns. That's all we are trying to do here, okay? So this is always true that whenever I have a matrix, I can immediately go for its uh, reduced row echelon form and uh, express that as the combination of C and R. Okay. So the number of independent columns equals the number of independent rows, which is already guaranteed here. And uh, this is the basic idea of factorization of the given matrix A. So if I have a matrix A, I can immediately go for something like the row space and column space of the given matrix and express the given matrix as the multiplication of these two matrices. And on top of it, if I try to express my, my column space vectors as the orthogonal columns and the row space as orthogonal rows, that's what uh, my idea of singular value decomposition, where the singular values are nothing but the square root of the eigenvalues of the given matrix. It's not the given matrix, we will do like a, a, A transpose and A transpose A and try to identify the eigenvalues of 
eigen values of those two matrices that will come into the picture when we try to factorize the given matrix a and when we try to go for the factorization of the given matrix what is the advantage uh, we may see is that the dimensionality reduction of uh, certain computational aspects so the big factorization for data science is the singular value decomposition of a where the the concept of the column space and the row space really plays a bigger role there we all know that when we start with a with the linear algebra getting the row space and the column space are nothing but just doing some operations and give the result like uh, these are the vectors which will which will span the given space and these are the columns vectors which are going to span the given space we try to say that okay they form the basis and we leave it there but actually speaking the the concept of implementation starts from that basic point of getting the reduced row echelon form after that we try to identify the columns and the rows and the express the given matrix as a factorization of simpler matrices and the concept of orthogonality uh, plays a bigger role because any two vectors they they two are perpendicular to each other which means that uh, computationally a lot of things can be reduced when we go for the factorization with respect to the orthogonal columns and orthogonal rows of a given matrix so this is the basic idea okay well as we saw how to multiply a matrix with a vector is it possible to extend the same concept for matrix matrix multiplication we very well know that uh, when we when we do uh, the product of two matrices we take the row of the first matrix and the column of the second matrix and uh, enter the corresponding uh, entry in the resultant matrix with the inner product of these two vectors well so we can immediately see that c23 is the combination of a21 plus b13 plus a22 plus b23 plus a23 plus b33 so that gives us the summation here there is another way of doing the same multiplication what we can do is using the outer product so in the inner product what we are trying to do is take the row and the column and in the outer outer product you do the reverse way what you do you take the column and the corresponding row and multiply it so which means that uh, which means that we have one column vector and one row vector immediately again guarantee that the certain matrix is a rank one matrix because as i see that uh, um, the the rows or the columns you can see that uh, when i go for the reduced row echelon form it will have only one row so it will become a it will become a rank one matrix this is nothing but uv transpose here so one column u times one row v transpose and if i look at the matrix multiplication of a 2 by 2 matrices two 2 by 2 matrices i can express this as express this as first column with the first row and the second column with the second row here and hence i can get the result as 2 4 6 and 17 well at this point of time one may think that uh, uh, with the inner product itself we are very much comfortable and uh, what we see is that uh, every element uh, in the resultant matrix can be expressed as the linear combination of these entries and uh, this looks uh, simple in terms of uh, the computational complexity whereas when we do the outer product here we are actually making every matrix multiplication as a 2 cross 2 matrix for a 2 by 2 matrix multiplication so the basic question is uh, are we not going for uh, uh, more number of operations here rather than with our regular matrix multiplication so in order to answer that in order to answer that what we have is you can see that uh, when we do the number of multiplication count the number of multiplications in a 2 cross 2 matrix multiplication we can see that uh, if my a is of uh, n by n as well as b is of n by n matrix i need uh, n to the power 3 multiplications to do the corresponding to get the corresponding resultant matrix and if it is a general matrix like a is a m cross n matrix and b is a n cross p matrix then naturally i may need m times n times p multiplications to in order to do the 
multiplication of two matrices. Well, when I go with row times column, it ended up with uh, M and P multiplications. If I go with column times rows also, we will have N outer products and also MP multiplications each, which means that we will have total number of operations as M, N, M times N times P, which means that in terms of complexity, it is not going to do much. It is going to be the same. So doing rows times columns is the same as column times row when we try to think in terms of the computational complexity. But the advantage what we have is that we are actually trying to express certain things in terms of linear combinations of the columns of the given matrix. That's the advantage we are really looking at. Then again, the same question, why we should look for column times row when we know the inner product? The, the answer is that uh, when we start uh, doing our uh, matrix factorization or the decomposition, so what we see is that uh, we there are very well well known concepts like LU decomposition and QR decomposition and also diagonalization process and we have uh, the singular value decomposition. So all these factorization methods requires this column times row rather than looking for the corresponding inner product solution. So if I understand the matrix matrix multiplication in terms of column times rows then immediately I can get into these factorizations and understand what is the role of these column times rows in these factorization methods. So the first one is making the matrix as the lower triangular and upper triangular matrices and the combination will give you the original matrix. The second is like uh, uh, QR decomposition where R is nothing but the corresponding corresponding row reduced row echelon form and the Q is nothing but the orthonormal normal columns using the gram schematic process. So orthogonalizing the columns A1 to A, AN using the gram schematic process, that is nothing but Q and R is nothing but the resultant upper triangular matrix of reduced row echelon form. And S equal to Q lambda Q transpose, it's again the diagonalization process, in particular when S is a symmetric matrix, in, the, in that case S becomes S is equal to S transpose. And uh, this is the um, uh, basic matrix algebra concept where we do the diagonalization of a symmetric matrix. And for a general matrix, we know that uh, the diagonalization process will involve eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the given matrix A. So A can be expressed as X lambda X inverse. And finally, the applications of uh, linear algebra in terms of uh, singular value decomposition. So when, when A is not a square matrix, we try to identify the, the orthogonal columns of uh, A transpose A using this U matrix and A A transpose using this B matrix and the corresponding eigenvalues as uh, square root of eigenvalues as singular values where that will be uh, uh, placed in the diagonal matrix called sigma here. So the singular value decomposition uses the, uses the concept of this column times row operation. So that is the importance of uh, looking at this column times rows. Well, so those uh, who wants to have a have an idea of gram schematic process, um, it's just the projection of a given vector into orthogonal vectors and uh, try to express it. Uh, 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 so try to express the given basis elements as orthogonal basis elements. That's all we are trying to do. So this one I will skip, maybe the next animation I will try to uh, play because that is very much important rather than looking for this gram schematic process. As we are looking for the diagonalization process in singular value decomposition, there are two things. One is symmetric matrix and another one is orthogonal matrix. And the idea of uh, the base of spectral theorem comes, comes from this, um, the orthogonal matrix concept, okay. And we can see that every symmetric matrix S has N real eigenvectors and N orthogonal, orthonormal eigenvectors. So before getting into uh, the further ideas, one may be thinking that uh, what, what is this SVD and how to get that? Because all other things are straight factorization methods. All other things are diagonalization process or uh, the LU decomposition or QR decomposition. 
we are not going to do anything uh, great we are just going to uh, going to work with uh, any square matrix but only for singular value decomposition we may work with uh, no, uh, uh, with uh, non square matrices what we try to do is when we have a 2 by 2 matrix we try to understand what is the what is a transpose a and a a transpose and one can verify that one can verify that the trace of these two matrices are same and we can guarantee that the eigen values of these two matrices will become the same so when the eigen values are same there are certain advantages there so when we when when i try to understand what is my u sigma and v here i can see that the columns of u are becoming orthogonal so 1 times minus 3 plus 3 times 1 will become 0 as well as the columns of v also becomes orthogonal 1 times minus 1 plus 1 uh, times 1 will become 0 and these two factors 1 by square root 10 and 1 by square root 2 are the normalizing factors for u and v and the corresponding sigma is nothing but the diagonal matrix where the entries are the square roots of the eigen values so i can see that uh, one eigen value is 45 the other one is 5 which is going to be like uh, the trace of a transpose a is 50 and is equal to the sum of the eigen values and in singular value decomposition the singular values are nothing but the square roots of the eigen values here square root of 45 and square root of 5 and a can be expressed as the matrix multiplication of u times sigma times v transpose that will give back your a and uh, where do we apply this singular value decomposition why so much about uh, singular value decomposition here because uh, all we see is that uh, for a given matrix i am getting three different matrices and where is the application we may not see um, a great thing all are again looking like the matrices here then what do you mean by the application here if somebody asks that i can give you one example of uh, this and tell that okay this is how we are applying the singular value decomposition for application oriented problems so the first one is the image compression and uh, image recovery is another one and when we try to match the faces we call it as eigen faces there and we have spectral clustering and uh, background removal from videos and a lot more are there any image or video is nothing but uh, the matrix representation with the pixels as its entries so when i have the matrix representation i can express them or try to understand them in terms of singular value decomposition and I try to minimize certain things called the dimension dimensionality reduction using this singular value decomposition so what is this uh, dimensionality reduction just uh, for an example uh, if i look at this picture it's a nice uh, sunrise picture or sunset i guess so this has a lot of details in it and when i when i look at this it's just an image so what i can do is i can go with the gray scale image of that so you can see that uh, the original image with the n components as 638 so it may be like a yeah 638 by 638 matrix what we have so when i have such a, a huge matrix and when i apply the when i apply the singular value decomposition there this sigma will have uh, 638 eigen vectors as well as the corresponding eigen eigen values as well as the corresponding eigen vectors will be there in u and v but what i can do is from that i can select only the 500 of each matrix and go for the matrix multiplication and uh, and convert back into an image what i see is that i am not losing much information when i when i just take 500 out of 638 rows and columns of the given matrix well even from 500 if i take 400 out of it i i, I can see only only the less deviation from the original image here and even with the 100 also i can i can see what is the corresponding image we are working with some kind of information it's we are not losing much information here so comparing these two working with the 638 size is much much uh, uh, bigger when i compare compare it with working with 100 100 entries 100 components 
So this is the role or this is the effectiveness of this singular value decomposition, what I am talking about. So when I select only the 100 eigenvalues from the given representation, and uh, if I go for reproducing this image, I can still see that a lot of information is present in this image. And uh, here, I may need uh, the 638 components to reproduce this, but with the 100 components itself, I can reproduce the original image in this sense, which means that this SVD helps us to go for the dimensionality reduction of any given image, which places an important role because currently we are working with a huge data size and people are thinking of reducing the data and uh, but not losing the information how to do it. And in that aspect, uh, this uh, dimensionality reduction will help us to retain the original representation of the given data. And also for image recovery, if I look at a few images with a masked original image, and if I separate them using the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I can still recover the original image from the masked image. This is another application where we can think of applying the linear algebra concept and the singular value decomposition method to, to get back the original image. So this is just identifying the dominant eigenvalues of the given representation and uh, reproduce the given image. That gives us a lot of uh, flexibility when somebody masks the original image and uh, some kind of, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, what I can say is that uh, retraction of the original image can be done using SVD. Well, if somebody is uh, interested in these applications and the implementation of uh, these algorithms, they can go with uh, this uh, analyticswithya.com and go for the, the applications of singular value decomposition using SVD in data science. You can see all those uh, presentations, how they effectively use this uh, linear algebra concept for this uh, image compression as well as the image recovery and the clustering concept and the other things. As we are talking about, uh, again, the row space and column space, we can say that um, we can say that uh, when I have a two by two matrix, um, so, so when I go for the column space of it, I see that u equal to one comma three, which means that uh, one column can be represented as a scalar multiplication of the other column, which means that column space uh, dimension is only one. So column space is consisting of the line through the vector u equal to one comma three. And column two is on that line. The row space will be the line through one comma two because first row alone, we can take it as the row space here that transpose will become. So the row space of uh, A transpose is going to be the, uh, the, the space uh, spanned by this vector one comma two. And immediately I can see that the null space will be orthogonal to the row space and hence the inner product between uh, these two will become zero. So I can see that the null space is spanned by the vector two comma minus one. And also the left null space will be orthogonal to the column space. And hence this null space of A transpose is perpendicular to the column space and is spanned by the vector three comma minus one. As I started uh, uh, in my lecture saying that uh, everything comes with the row space column space, immediately we can see that the role of this column space, row space, null space and null, left null space plays an important role in terms of orthogonality. What is that orthogonality? So when we go with the reduced row echelon form, the, the, the pivotal entry rows will, will span the corresponding row space. And if I go for the corresponding representation of AX equal to zero, the homogeneous system, I can identify the vectors, uh, um, uh, the basis for the null space. And immediately I can guarantee that uh, the row space will be orthogonal to the null space. And similarly, the pivotal entries, uh, if I extract the corresponding columns from the original matrix, I can identify the column space. And immediately I can guarantee that the left null space will be orthogonal to the column space. So indirectly, we are trying to trying to connect the reduced row echelon form with the orthogonality concept here. Give me a second. So for any given matrix, 
for any given matrix if i identify the row space and null space immediately i can guarantee that they two will be orthogonal to each other so what is the meaning of it when i take any vector in that corresponding in that corresponding vector space that can be represented as a linear combination of two orthogonal spaces vectors well just as a matter of fact uh, i will play this video to understand uh, to understand the orthogonality concept and then i will i will quickly uh, go for the rest of the things let us quickly go through this um, video to understand the concept of orthogonality so that my lecture will be Hello, much more uh, easier to the first video in our webinar series on the topic of orthographic projection so in this video we're going to look at general projection systems and the components that are needed to create a projection so we're going to begin by first of all just asking the question what is a projection system well a projection first of all is defined as the presentation of an image on a surface so the presentation of an image onto a surface and um, a projection system then is a method or a set of rules to actually get help us to do this so when it comes to the projection systems that we're going to be dealing with we have three basic components and um, each of them we can see here in our little example and um, the first of which is a viewing direction here represented by a torch so a torch shines light in a particular direction the second component then is an object something that we actually want to represent uh, here but represented by our little lego man and then the third thing then is a screen which to project our image onto so our screen the graphical term for that is known as a plane of reference sorry or a reference plane and there are three components there are different types of projection systems that we can use and we look at two in particular perspective projection and orthographic projection but they all involve the same basic three components so how we get our image of our ob um, from our object onto our screen um, is gotten by essentially casting light so you all be familiar with the idea of casting a shadow onto a screen well if we have our torch shining in a particular direction that's going to cast rays of light and you can see here they are getting wider the further back they go well these rays of light are known as projection lines and what they do is they gather up the outline of our object and they cast that or project that onto a screen giving us our um, our image or our shadow in this case here so this is our perspective projection and you can see there's our image and the size of our image is larger than the original object that's what makes this a perspective projection so we're going to concentrate for the moment on what is orthographic projection so the three components are exactly the same we have our direction we have our object and we have our plane of reference the only difference is that instead of the likes of a torch we're just going to think of it just purely as an arrow just a direction that we're looking in um, in that direction so our lines are rays of light instead of coming from one single point spreading outwards in orthographic projection our rays of light are all moving back in the same direction as our viewing direction here so they don't spread out as they get further back and they cast our image here onto our um, plane of reference and you can see because all the rays of light move straight back in line with our line of sight the resulting image that we have here is the same size as the original object well so so in the video we have seen like uh, one is the perspective projection the other one is the orthogonal projection so the orthogonal projection becomes more important uh, when we talk about uh, the shortest distance from the uh, from a uh, vector to the plane or point to a uh, uh, line so the concept of orthogonal projection comes as uh, some kind of uh, shortest distance problem here and we see that uh, the when we do that projection perspective projection is making the picture as uh, bigger or smaller whereas the orthogonal projection is retains some kind of pattern there okay so in that aspect i would like to emphasize certain things on orthogonality 
and uh, when we talk about the orthogonality indirectly when we talk about the row space and column null space they both are orthogonal to each other and the column space and the corresponding uh, transpose of uh, the given matrix null space they both are orthogonal to each other well um, i i think i have only uh, five minutes to wind up i will just uh, uh, talk about the decomposable operator on matrix multiplication and uh, how do we do for uh, playing with the image in terms of uh, computing them and all so uh, so matrix multiplication as a decomposable operator what we try to do is we try to we try to express the given matrix as a as a um, uh, interchange operator or addition operation or scaling operation so what is that uh, uh, what is the meaning of this uh, uh, this uh, decomposable operator it could be either the rotation or the reflection or the scaling and in terms of matrices we can say that uh, when we work with uh, the two dimensional space the rotation can be uh, taken as uh, the 2 by 2 matrix cos theta minus sin theta sin theta and cos theta reflection is nothing but uh, multiplying the given vector with 1 0 0 minus 1 will reflect the given point about the x axis whereas uh, the scaling is nothing but either expanding or shrinking a given vector so scale x and y by factors of c1 and c2 is nothing but uh, the scaling factor here and a shear transformation is nothing but uh, slightly uh, moving an object in one direction you can see that the original uh, original location is 2 comma 1 whereas the transformed location is 2.2 comma 1 when we do when we operate this matrix on the given vector so this is called the shear transfer transform of a given vector here okay and uh, and the shear transform can be generalized using 1c01 here so one may ask uh, why do we need uh, such uh, uh, decomposition this will make this will make a linear transformation as a succession of uh, simpler transforms so using these operations this decomposition operation makes our computation quite easy that's all it is going to be so so to outline few things in in our in our uh, uh, machine learning using linear algebra machine learning is about constructing models on observed examples in the rows of data matrices and uh, using these models to make predictions about missing entries of previously unseen examples what it does is for the given scenario it learns the current scenario and it try to predict the future automatically this is what we are doing it in artificial intelligence so what is the assumption they are making they try to make some assumptions and they try to learn the data and they give the solution and another thing what we can think is the matrix factorization there are two different things one is matrix decomposition the other one is matrix factorization matrix decomposition is nothing but the the decomposition of the original matrix using the orthogonal property or lu or qr or uh, diagonalization process comes under matrix decomposition whereas when we talk about uh, the the matrix factorization it is actually the same de decomposition in terms of optimization centric view that's all it is going to be so matrix factorization is same as matrix decomposition when we move from linear algebra to uh, optimization problems okay and again uh, with uh, all these things and uh, because of uh, lack of uh, timing i am i am i am, I am actually uh, finishing my lecture with a few details on how do we do the transforming and other things here so the application of linear algebra you can see it in recommender systems and also in clustering and uh, we can introduce the concept of vector space in terms of machine learning when we start talking about these row spaces, column spaces, and the corresponding null spaces. And uh, the mean centering of an image is nothing but moving an object to the center here. So that's all we are doing. So subtract the row wise mean will give you the mean centering. It is nothing but a translation operation here. And also you can see that uh, some of them like, uh, like um, when we have the data points here instead of working with the x and y axis if i just uh, move to a new x and y axis with the orthonormal columns then any vector can be represented as a linear combination of these two vectors they where 
they both are orthogonal to each other that makes the computation much simpler and also we can extend our concept of rotation to the 3d rotation axis using givens rotation and a household all reflections so these are all the generalization of the two dimensional uh, rotation and reflection and uh, and i think uh, with that i will just uh, conclude my today's talk with this uh, um, pictorial representation of how do we use this orthogonal and scaling transformations so if i have the original original data here this is just the just the rotation of uh, a given data by multiplying with a vector v so that that rotates the given image by an angle then what is that we are doing multiply diagonal matrix with the entry 210.5 will make this image as some kind of um, uh, expanded image here then again the rotation will give you this so overall we can see that we can do all this uh, rotation shrinking and expanding an image using all these basic transformations okay so i think uh, with that i will uh, wind up my today's session and uh, if you have any questions you can post it now or you can ask me sir i have doubt sir yes sir tell me sir uh, doctor yes sir i have a small query two to three queries are there so for example suppose when you are having one matrix whose order is m cross m so if i want to apply qr decomposition the order uh, the if you want if i want to apply qr decomposition the matrix should be m greater than or equal to n in real time i am come across some problems m less than n is it possible to apply svd decomposition or some other method see when we go with the svd all we are talking about uh, is uh, a transpose a and a a transpose they both are always going to be a square matrix and hence svd is always possible when you come across any kind of matrix and oh, all sure. symmetric matrices will have the eigen values as uh, real eigen values so it is possible with svd is it possible for singular matrix yes of course because for singular matrix you can say that a a transpose will become non singular oh okay so naturally you will get the eigen values and eigen vectors and you can go with svd there okay i have one more question you answered both i uh, i have one more query yes sir uh, you talk about the machine language it is like a model then what is the difference between simulation and machine language machine learning well in simulation we have to give the procedure Uh, so if this is the first step what is the second step what will be the input and from that uh, output what will be the third step and we have to give the flow chart okay whereas in machine learning it uh, learns by itself so all we need is we just need to uh, uh, name a procedure or we try to understand it using a algorithm so it learns the data on its own and it gives you a model and we have to verify whether the model is going to be useful or not with that um, uh, so what we do is normally we we separate a data set as uh, testing data and training data and we try to justify our model using the testing data that's what we do <coughs> uh, so when you go for machine language we need some softwares of course yes because we will be working with a huge data actually so, uh, so as far as the simulation concern it is not uh, it is not needed we can do it by manually also um uh, normally uh, we will go for simulations and all when when we cannot handle it manually so for that also we may need some kind of uh, programming uh, base to go for uh, uh, simulating it okay it's a python is a good or some other special software which is you know, available for special you know, sage python mathematica matlab whichever is comfortable we can go with it and it is the matter of whether we can buy it or we can use the open source software that's all okay thank you very much thank you sir sir ashuram sir uh, you right ah uh, yes yes sir please i have a couple of questions sir uh, one is that how effective your methods uh, when the uh, size of the matrices are so large like uh, a real time picture will have more than 1500 rows or something like that well as i said one of the image compression um, uh, problem so we have seen that uh, the huge matrix can be reduced to a 100 size and we can still get the gather the same information now in in that case sir what is there any compact formula for how, how much can you reduce it 
like you showed an example of reducing 68 to 100 yes in that yes. case i can see as a mathematician i could optimize it to size 5 or 10 or even 1 now well, is there any bound for it to it, reduce it depends on the threshold limit what we fix it actually some kind of hmm? measure we need to introduce based on the measure if uh, it is exceeding the some kind of epsilon value then we will stop our procedure naturally we will not have any any so is there any bound for issue. such reduction that is what i am asking actually we will not fix that actually even see if i am dealing with a, a 1 lakh by 1 lakh matrix with uh, all are linearly dependent even uh, one vector is enough to represent the entire uh, uh, data so it is about uh, the linear independence of the data what we are trying to work with first of all then after that the dominance of eigen values will tell you uh, how many uh, how, so the reduction of the given data can be done with respect to what ratio okay so so people will fix the reduction with respect to the dominance of the eigen values they will not have any fixed number of uh, threshold limit for any given problem so they apply the concept of dominance there suppose if we have more than 100 eigen values or it will it's not difficult to do this then well it doesn't matter because uh, because when you have more than 100 eigen values you can uh, still see that uh, all 100 eigen values may not be dominant compared to uh, uh, like uh, what i say is that uh, only few of them will be dominating the entire data so we can work uh, with those dominant eigen values so we can start with the spectrum of those eigen values and work with the reduced data that's what i mean that so there is no real time formula or uh, anything that you can normally they go for the ratio between the dominant eigen values and the sum of the total eigen values that gives them some idea about uh, how to fix the threshold limit okay okay so uh, and uh, i have i know that uh, transforms like gabber transform and other uh, binomial transforms and other things are very effective in making this uh, compression and doing with uh, digital images processing compressing of images and all those things can be done effectively by transforms yes. in that case how good is this idea useful comparatively no this is one of the ideas people still are exploring all those things i am i am not giving or comparing all the no, existing methods no, here no i mean uh, how good is this compared to that method uh, i am not sure sir i have worked with this but uh, gabber transform and all um, i still see the advantage of the orthogonality in svd and all okay but i had uh, but, used uh, some idea in gabber transforms and i think that is equally effective also in my opinion yeah there well, one should go for the comparative study to talk about the effectiveness of one okay. over the other that's what okay, okay. so okay. that can be done and people can explore all those options also okay thank you sir thank you. thank you thank you so much and uh, any other question yes okay. I think no more to present. Yes, ma'am. I think we can. Thank you so much, sir, for your excellent presentation and valuable inputs. We are enlightened with your knowledge on this topic, sir. Dear participants, our valuative session starts at 4:30 p.m. Yes, we can start. I have joined, madam. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Hi, sir, sir. Good evening, sir. It's audible, sir. Good evening, sir. How are good evening, you? Good evening, sir. Good, sir. Good evening, sir. Principal, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Madam, shall we? Shall we start the valedictory session, sir? Yes. Okay. Okay, now we will move to the validity function. I request all the participants to join for the validity function for the seven days virtual faculty program on aspects of mathematics. Jai Shri Krishna. Namaste to everyone for the validity function.
of the seven days faculty development program on aspects of mathematics. Yet bhavam tat bhavati, you are what you believe. A very warm good evening to one and all. I take it a great privilege in welcoming our secretary, Shri Ashokumar Mundraji, Principal Dr. Santosh Babu, Professor Venkatramanan, Head PG and Research Department of Mathematics, Professor Devika, Convener, DG Vaishnav College, Dr. Venkatesh, Adjunct Professor, IITB India, Professor of Mathematics and Computer Science, Myanmar Institute of Information Technology, Myanmar, and Chief Guest Dr. Mukti Acharya, Professor, Department of Mathematics, Christ University, Bangalore, and all the dedicated faculties, students, and all the participants for the UGC sponsored seven days faculty development program of aspects of mathematics organized by the PG and research department of mathematics. A pessimist complains about the wind, an optimist tries to change it, and the leader adjusts the sails. The sails for this particular notion were adjusted by a person who is not only the great motivation to all of us, but a visionary and the person who gave us the belief to bring together this event. He is none other than our principal. So may I take the pleasure of requesting our principal, Dr. Santosh Babu, to give the address for the valedictory session. Good evening. I am very happy to be with you on the end of the seven-day faculty development program with uh, Dr. Vantesh, who is very known to me when I was working in MS University itself. And also your HOD, head of the department, Vangat Ramanan, though he is not feeling well for the past 15 to 20 days, but he is, he is able to sit with uh, uh, Dr. Devika, madam, and uh, he is able to conduct this uh, program virtually. Always the program is going virtually, but as far as HOD is concerned, even he is not feeling well, he used to call me in the evening and he used to talk to me about the program and uh, you will get the feedback. And also the madam have used to come to me every day and he used to talk about uh, the program's um, um, speakers who are going to deliver a content on a particular day. Really, the seven days is a very, import, very important day for the max uh, paternity. As far as uh, mathematics is concerned, in the present scenario, we are not able to get a very quality um, professors and also quality in the, at the entry level. I'm talking about entry level. Suppose if you, if you go for assistant professor recruitment and other things, getting a quality faculty is very difficult for us because of uh, uh, modern technologies like nanotechnology, biotechnology and uh, computer science. The people started uh, giving less importance to mathematics. But one thing every, everyone should accept is without mathematics, there is no science. So the math mathematics is a very important subject for all the science where we need the derivations, where we have to talk about the formulas. Everything will be the step-by procedure. Any research will have a step-by step procedures. For each, each procedure, there will be input, there will be a process, and there will be output. So all these things will be, uh, will be taught only in mathematics. So keeping in this mind, uh, the faculty of uh, DG Vaishnava College have conducted this uh, seven days faculty development program for the faculty members. It was uh, widely um, um, attended by the uh, faculties of uh, mathematics, not only mathematics and also the students have attended this program. And definitely this seven days program would have given the eye opener for all the mathematical uh, faculty uh, developing gaps in various areas. We know that in previously, a, a particular faculty will be good in calculus, a particular faculty will be in trigonometry, a particular faculty will be good in fuzzy logic, like that, machine language. Like that is the, the mathematics is growing in such a way that going for an advanced te techniques like even you can use it for data analytic, fuzzy logic, artificial intelligence, all these things, the mathematics are very useful for the society. So keeping in this mind, the faculties also now started uh, exploring themselves not only to the specific uh, topic and they are exploring themselves to the various topics of mathematics and they started, uh, they have started upgrading themselves according to the need of the uh, present scenario. So all these things are happening in the field of mathematics and there is next shift is coming now. For the past three, four years, the students started coming for learning mathematics uh, and also um, the faculty is also making the other uh, departments, like if you, if you go for an engineering, uh, the max one, max two is very tough for the students. They will clear all the papers, 
at the end of the fourth year they will have two years it will be a mathematics one and mathematics two even in computer science and other allied subject also the students uh, used to feel very difficult to clear the paper because while uh, reading or when when you uh, when you want to uh, understand mathematics without involvement without uh, putting full effort in the mind you could not learn you could not solve any problem so you should be more attentive when you are uh, uh, writing the program even if you skip a single uh, single process or single uh, steps you could not arrive the solution but in theory and other things even if you miss something you can end you can end the uh, work in a, a good manner but mathematics is not like that it should be a step by step solution is to be given for any problem so the more attend attention is necessary for the students so uh, nowadays because of all these things the attention seeking is less for the students also so we have to the, the mathematics uh, faculty are facing more problem with respect to teaching mathematics also because making all the uh, students are consisting of 50 students 60 students suppose when you go for science it will be 52 students even in some cases it is 70 students so uh, teaching all the 70 students is really a tough job in spite of that the faculties are doing their level best as far as dg vaishnava college is concerned i am very happy to say that we are having an efficient and good faculties where we are able to manage around 4000 students in a campus the total campus consisting of 10000 directly and indirectly there may be 4000 to 5000 students are learning mathematics 50% of the students are learning that each and every college you used to say that 70% used to learn language like tamil and english but next is the mathematics so with these few words once again i like to congratulate the department for conducting this program and also i like to thank all the resource person because the uh, fixing the resource person is very difficult and also the resource person also are accepted our uh, request and they have given their topic and they have given their lecture on a particular date that is also very important so i like to congratulate and also i like to thank especially all the resources person from various institution for de delivering a lecture to the faculty members and teachers With these few words once again i like to thank the organizer for conducting this day fdp program this should not be the end it should be a, this is the beginning here after every semester we should have some fdp fdt program like this and this because of corona we are able to learn how to do it through online even if you want to have it offline uh, collecting all the people in a single place this is very difficult because of the technology the things are recorded and this can be replayed and we, they can learn again now also so with these few words thank you very much for giving this opportunity thank you thank you sir thank you for your enthusiastic words the fragments of flower spread only in the direction of the wind but the goodness of a person spreads in all directions we are delighted to have dr mukti acharya professor department of mathematics rice university bangalore as a honorable chief guest for the valedictory ceremony it's my great privilege to introduce our thank chief guest welcome, welcome madam thank you for accepting our offer madam thank you thank, thank you, you very much thank you thank you people like you have to help the institution like this to uh, enrich the knowledge madam thank you thank you sir so it's my great privilege to introduce our chief guest dr mukti acharya Dr Mukti Acharya completed her MSc from the Moscow University in 1974 and then her PhD in IIT Bombay. She was appointed as a visiting scientist at Meghta Research Institute at Allahabad. Madam joined IIT Delhi as a CSIR pool officer and then as a lecturer in NCERT Delhi. She works as an independent researcher and has several visiting faculty positions. Her main contributions are in SciGraph, graph spectra, graph labeling and tetrinets. to her credit she has published many papers in national and international journals i now invite dr mukti acharya to give the valedictory address over to you ma'am thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to for today's uh, this one anyway i wanted to attend other lectures also but i told venkatesh raman that your time does not suit me because 4:30 usually is the time for my rest and uh, the today i told madam today you come okay i told her everything i have to pre pound take one hour rest and attend your this one thank you very much i just uh, add little bit uh, to my biodata 
After working at NCRT in 1994, I joined Delhi College of Engineering, which is Delhi Technological University. And uh, I retired from there as a professor in November 2013. So when I was at, uh, when I joined uh, Delhi College of Engineering in 1994, mathematics uh, did not have the culture of uh, taking the students for PhD. And my desire was, of course, with N NCRT, I was not very much happy because it was a table job. And only that uh, sometime uh, you have a, you have to go to other states for teachers training. But anyway, when this uh, DC uh, post came through UPSC, it was my luck or maybe my interest for teaching. So where I really wanted, uh, 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 of course, uh, once I go there, I have to teach BTEC students. There is no MSc, BSc and other thing. But I was more interested to have research scholars. So I took uh, Dr. Tarkeshwar Singh as my first research scholar in 2000. 1999, or 98, he came it. But uh, let me come to the main aim of your uh, faculty debit program, which was aspects of mathematics. It is a very vast subject, very vast topic. Okay, so anybody can have, uh, take up anything at a school level, how to teach it, how to inspire the young, uh, or young students. Uh, towards the mathematics. As uh, everybody thinks the mathematics is difficult, people don't understand. Actually, with the, the experience of uh, teaching, we ourselves, teachers, come to know where we are lacking. When I say lacking, we are lacking means I mean the teaching community and basically persons who are involved in the teaching of mathematics. There are many things to be taken care of, but uh, I just explained my experience when I was an NCRT. When I joined, at N I, uh, it was in um, 88, 88, 89, they introduced uh, one topic uh, called uh, algorithms. That is uh, basically using the pseudo language to write the algorithms. And Teachers were not aware of this one. The question came how to you know, make them, uh, how to create the teachers so that they are able to teach the students and they are able to later on work as a resource person. Usually any, any university, any department in the university, first they try to make resource person from their own faculty who can take up any subject, whatever it may be, which is needed in the college for, uh, for the other faculty, for other people. So when I, uh, since uh, I did uh, during my PhD, I did uh, this, uh, what you call it, Fortran programming, which is not, now is not being done. So I knew what happens, uh, this one, uh, that is what is the language, programming language and how, what are the logarithms, how to develop the logarithms even for small problems. And at MSc level, we have a machine language. Using the machine language, we were asked to write the programs and do some programming. But uh, since uh, we have to teach uh, the teachers as uh, the uh, logarithms, we say step-by-step -step procedure, which is involved in every every work of our life, wherever we are, whether we are in the house or we are traveling or we are making our, we have to make our journey, there is a step-by-step -step procedure to implement that program, implement that uh, our uh, schedules. So one day I was asked to come to have a class for the teachers and daily itself, that SCRT, na? Uh, science uh, engineering, which are the state level. NCRT is the national level, SCRT is at the state levels. And then lower comes DITs. So I went and one day what I saw, some teachers are sitting outside. They are not coming for the class. 
because in every group you will have some dadas. Of course, they must be having 20 years, 30 years experience teaching at the school level. But when they, when we ask everybody, or even if we ask to our kids or our, our research scholars to learn something, they hesitate. You take research scholars who joins or after completing the coursework, if you give him or her some paper, please work out this paper and then we will have the discussion. The first question from the research scholar comes, how will I, how I will get benefited from this paper? Which is a, what I feel, even a, a person who is a research guide cannot answer this question. Because once you come to the research, it is first you understand what is research. It is not your MSc course, MPhil course or BSc course. You spent three years, you spent two years or whatever um, is there and you will get the degree. Nowadays, uh, the student, uh, I want to submit my thesis in three years, but one year they take to complete their coursework. And during the coursework, they, it will be very difficult for them to select the problem and work on that problem seriously. So the, what uh, aspects of mathematics or as a research guide, first of all, we should be able to make, uh, tell the research scholars, see, once you come for the research, you must know what this course is. What this course is. After spending two years, one year goes for coursework, one year, whatever has been done. Then students start and ask, Madam, can, when I can submit my thesis? See, what happens, how the thesis will go? It's not a, you pass some, uh, uh, exam and we will give you the marks and it is over. So here, the, when, when we talk about aspect of mathematics, let me say uh, aspect of, aspects of research. Research needs little bit, not little bit, it needs thinking, it needs logic, it needs how, it need, uh, the, see guide cannot make out how fruitful your brain is, how rich your brain is. So he or she, the research guide will come to know unless, uh, will not be knowing unless uh, you give uh, some paper you work out, present this paper with the proofs, only then the problem can be selected. Secondly, the research scholar will always think that the uh, guide should give the research problem. But I am reverse. I will say you go and spend time in the library take one month, take two months, so many journals are there, because in our time, there was no computer. There, there was no, what you call it, Google search that you search and you will get the material, no. You find out what is good for you. Spend two hours, three hours in a day, and then you will be knowing that this is a topic where I can put my brain and my brain will work and some good work will be produced. So let me now come back. Uh, this is a research. Uh, this motivation for research. We have to, as a research scholar, we have to motivate the research scholars first. Let them know. Let us not treat, the, treat them as MSc students or MPhil students. Because MSc course and MPhil course, they have some subject to clear. Okay, they will mug and give the exam and other things. No, and go ahead. Get pass and, uh, okay, I got 99% I get. In our times, 99%, we never got it. But still we <laughs> came to the job and the first division was the more than enough. And now the 99 parents will say, why you have not got 100? Why we are bugging their minds? The child should be able to understand, grasp and go ahead. And then nowadays I see the books. Recently, about two, two three days back, my experience. Here only, my, my neighbor knows, she has a small daughter. She's in fifth standard. Now they are having exams. And she requests me, uh, auntie, you just uh, take her class, uh, make her uh, to understand mathematics. So okay, girl came. I asked what, what you want. I saw her book. And uh, he said, uh, auntie, I want to have a, a, a perimeter and area. I'm not able to understand what is perimeter. 
Okay, with the examples, another things I explained what is perimeter. You see, in the book, they will have a square, they will have a rectangle, they will have a triangle, but they will not have any jig-jog, jig-jog figures, no. The area to jig-jog, jig-jog figures is very difficult to find. Perimeter is very difficult to visualize what we actually need it. So she could understand uh, perimeter. Then comes the area. Area they take for uh, square, rectangle, and triangle. And triangle also initially they talk about the right, ang right angle triangle. The area, height, one by two, height to base. That's one, okay. Then, uh, okay, she could, then she said, Auntie, I'm not able to know mug, why the area of a triangle is half of length into height. Okay, the question which I tell, okay, I told, okay, I will explain you. Okay, I took two pieces of paper. First is rectangle form. She could tell me the, gave some side. She could give me the area. Okay, then I, diagonally I cut it. I get two triangles, no? I get two triangles. Then I said, what is this? She says, a triangle. So I put it in any way, not that base should be, you know, as a figure. It can be, I can put the triangle in any way. Then I told, uh, no, uh, if I combine both the triangle, it is your square or a, a rectangle, you get the, uh, afterwards I cut it, become a triangle. So why it is half? Why I putting length into height? But instead of uh, breadth, we are putting height because we can say it is the height of the triangle, which is basically it is the breadth in the, uh, what you call in a rectangle or in a square. So she could say, no, I will not remember. I know what, what is the height of a triangle length into breadth. A study she wanted to do, introduce her to, you know, uh, fraction, fractionals, fractions. I asked her, okay, tell me, I will mean, laugh with her and tease her also, that just 11 years old girl. What is fraction? Then she gives me that reply. It is a part of a whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole. I was also surprised. I told, what is part of a whole? What is whole? My told, I give the spelling H-O-L-E, that is also whole. Then she looked at me. Then um, I told her, you, can you tell me, why, why you are telling is a part of a whole? And you say, no, auntie, because when I looked at the book, the answer was the same, it is a part of a whole. Fraction is a part of a whole. Later on, there is A by B, A is the numerator, B is the denominator, like that uh, they tell it. So the initial start, it is a mugging. Teacher read that, uh, no, that sentence from the book, uh, she said it's a part of a whole, that's all. Because not is online uh, teaching. So part of a whole means whole can be anything, no. Then I told, okay, I, I don't agree with you, but I will explain you. You take whatever five by four. What is five? Is the integer, the whole number. Four is also a whole number. But if I remove, uh, I, I don't know, I just take five. Or I just take uh, four. Then it is not a fraction. They say they are integers, and then become whole numbers. So the, here, what I feel, the explanation is lacking. Explanation is lacking. We are using the words which we use in our daily work, but in mathematics, sir, that daily used words words I don't think will create any activity in the minds of the students. Then yesterday only my one one of my grandson is in fifth standard. He's in Canada. I asked him, what are you doing? Daddy, we have started algebra. We have started algebra. Fifth standard boy starting algebra. So what are you doing algebra? Then uh, he just uh, taking without taking the week said we are doing equations. Okay, then I told, what is your equation? He said one plus three, no, some a plus yeah, x plus three is equal to eight. Then he told me this is left hand side, this is right hand side. And I told, what, uh, what, uh, what you do? No, I can, uh, whatever I do with the right hand side, I can do with the left hand side. Then I asked, her, what you can do with the right hand side? Then he was looking at me, he was looking at his father, what daddy is asking. 
I told her, okay, I agree with you. X plus five is equal to eight is an equation. Then I told, can you explain me something more? Then he explained me. Then he said, if I add something in the left hand side, I have to add in the right hand side also. That if I, he said, I put, he did not use the word addition, subtraction, multiplication. He said, if I do something with this one, so my emphasis to tell me what you can do. Then I told, I can do one thing. Okay, I have right hand side, I have left hand side. I give sweet to the right hand side, then I will give sweet to the left hand side also. I give a, a chapati to the right hand side, I have to give chapati to the left hand side. Are you doing same thing? No, Dadi, I cannot do that one. Then I told what you can do. Then he said, okay, I will show my notebook. I will show you my notebook. He showed me the notebook. It is plus, uh, x plus three is equal to eight. Then he said, the three I have to knock down. The three I have to no knock down. So I put minus. So right side also I will put minus. Then he takes uh, uh, some x minus eight is equal to 14. Then he said, here I have to knock down eight. I have to do plus and this one. So basically, uh, when we talk about algebra or equations, uh, what, okay, we can do whatever I do with the right hand side, I, we can do the left hand side also. But the question we should make them understand and that what we can do, what are there? So there you are four mathematical operations coming to play the big role. What are those operations? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Apart from this, we cannot do anything at uh, any, whatever the level may be. At present, when they teach them, they say we have to minus, this is minus, we have to plus, this is plus, that is I agree. But the language used should convey the message to the students, that is, we can do only these things, not anything other than this. And similarly, you take uh, your uh, computer science. Basic thing, let us go to logic, uh, developing the program, step, step by step procedure. If the step by step procedure is not correct, we will be writing so many for loops, do loops, while loop, and other things. Nowadays, uh, what have we teach them the theory? Leave them the, we teach them the theory. Okay, you do the program yourself. So they don't know how the, inner loops of far, 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 how the loops work. They get confused with that one. So basically the aspects of mathematics as I think, and uh, of course uh, I have uh, seen your uh, faculty who has delivered uh, the talks, and uh, I am uh, very happy to let you know that two of the faculty members, I have heard them many times. One is Jagdish Chand Bansali, who is from South Asian University, Delhi. And other is uh, Dr. Kusum Deep from IIT Roorkee. I have heard many times in my life, they are good teachers. They convey uh, this one. Other one, of course, uh, Vankatesh, I have not heard his lecture, but we are very old friends. <laughs> I think 2006, I know him from 2006, when there was a ICDM conducted at, uh, I think, IIC Bangalore, if I'm not wrong, because so much time has passed. And uh, uh, when we conduct this faculty, what is the main aim of faculty development program conducted by any university, any college? Basically, it is to refresh the knowledge of the teachers. Because if I'm working on graph labeling, it does not mean that I will be good in fuzzy logic. But I now must know that is such a topic, fuzzy logic is there. So unless they, they are, they, some lectures have been delivered to them. Uh, they only then we will come to know that what is fuzzy logic, and it's quite possible somebody may get interest or maybe find himself or self that I can do work in fuzzy logic. So that that is uh, that comes how we can grow the branches of a tree. One college, any institution is a tree. The teachers of their branches and further branches become their students. So uh, branches will grow provided we give good water to the roots. So there, this uh, faculty development program basically is a nurture 
our teachers, of course, the students also, MPhil students, some M MSc students will also be attending the classes. And those uh, at the MSc level who come for these classes, it means they want to find the path of their life, how good they can be in mathematics, how the mathematics can make their career. So with the, these few words, uh, I'm very happy that is uh, your college, uh, DG Vaishnav College conducted this course and uh, faculty development course. And I think it should continue, if not yearly, uh, once in two years, we should have, because the faculty will be new, some new input will be there. They have to be told about the culture of the college, how we can go. And once uh, we take them into our culture, and the growth will automatically be there. With these few words, I thanks your faculty and uh, your authorities calling me for this lecture. And uh, I'm happy, but only that I could not take advantage of your previous lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your influential and uh, motivational message. We are really very much benefited by your deep knowledge, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request Dr. Venkatesh, adjunct professor of Maths and Computer Science, Myanmar Institute of Technology, to say a few words about our faculty development group. That please. Good evening to all. Uh, any program started, it has to end. So we are at the frag end of the program. Uh, fortunately, I started the, I was the inaugural address speaker that day. So I also enjoyed the session, some session I attended, some of the sessions I watched on the YouTube. Uh, as I said at the beginning, and Madam also said the same thing, this faculty development program is giving a path to learn something. Some of us can pick up certain areas and start working on that side here. So the program went really as planned. That is the first sign of victory. Then participants also attended. Those who are in the online mode, therefore people here and there miss something, they will watch later. Uh, very nicely organized. First, I have to congratulate in the entire mathematics department for organizing this program in a nice manner without any problem. So everything went well. So therefore, all this goes to you people only, the department people, as well as the support of management, as well as principal extended days cooperation in both the days he was available. So that's a great support. So you can continue doing this kind of things so that we'll be learning, our students will be benefiting. So it's a message to all the faculty members as well as other college people also can benefit. So nice platform. As rightly said, it's a virtual platform given an opportunity to do such things. Uh, Madam also pointed out instead of every year, it can happen once in two years. Fine, it is up to us and we have to go at the same time. We have to keep the momentum going without losing our main work. The main work is teaching and research that's supposed to be on all the time. Thank you so much. Essentially, thanking everyone listening this um, session also. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you for an inspiring uh, speech. Sir. Thank you. Now I request uh, Professor Devika, convener, PG and Research Department of Mathematics to give the report about the faculty development program and to propose the oath of thanks. Honorable Secretary Sri Ashok Kumar Mundraji, respected principal, Dr. S. Santosh Babu, respected chief guest for today's valedictory function, Dr. Mukti Acharya Ma, and Dr. K. A. Vikrish, faculties and participants throughout India, good evening to all. As a convener of UGC sponsored national level seven days virtual faculty development program on aspects of mathematics, it's my privilege to be presenting the report of the faculty development program held between 22nd March to 28th March, 2021, amongst the most esteemed personalities in their respective fields. The faculty development program started on 22nd March, 2021 with inaugural session. And the welcome address was given by convener Professor M. Devika of Postgraduate and Research Department of Mathematics. 
the inaugural address followed with a message from the secretary shri ashok kumar mundraji and the presidential address was delivered by dr s santosh babu the principal of dg vaishnav college the keynote address was given by dr k a venkatesh adjunct professor iit bombay india professor of mathematics and computer science Myanmar Institute of Information Technology, Mandalay, Myanmar. The faculty development program had four, fourteen invited talks presented by eminent professors to share their knowledge and vast experience with the faculties. On day one, invited talk one by Dr. Jagdish Chand Banzali, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics, South Asian University, New Delhi, was on the topic. swarm intelligence an intelligent way of optimization invited talk to by dr k n raghavan professor of mathematics institute of mathematical sciences chennai was on the topic the line of best fit a linear algebraic approach on day 2 the invited talk one by dr n anbargan professor and head department of mathematics alagappa university karikudi was on the topic base talk policy with detrial demands demands the second talk was delivered by dr kusumdeep professor department of mathematics indian institute of technology durki was on the topic advances in nature inspired optimization techniques on day 3 the invited talk won by dr parameswaran shankaran professor of mathematics chennai mathematical institute chennai was on the topic simple groups and invited talk to by dr mukesh kumar sharma associate professor department of mathematics chaudhary charan singh university meerut was on the topic soft computing on day 4 invited talk one by dr r sundareswar assistant professor department of mathematics ssn college of engineering chennai was on the topic outer complete fair domination in graphs and the second talk by dr ds nagaraj retired professor faculty of mathematics institute of mathematical sciences chennai was on the topic symmetries and groups on day 5 the invited talk won by dr s minirani associate professor of mathematics department of basic sciences and humanities mp stme nm ims mumbai was on the topic predictive modeling and the second invited talk was by dr manish shankar faculty of mathematics university of technology and applied sciences ibri sutanate of oman on day 6 invited talk won by dr k a venkatesh adjunct professor iit bombay india professor of mathematics and computer science myanmar institute of information technology mandalay myanmar was on the topic tropical mathematics the second talk was by dr pankaj srivastava professor formerly head department of mathematics mn national institute of technology prayagraj was on the topic soft computing dynastic system on day 7 the final day invited talk 1 was delivered by dr r sivaraman associate professor department of mathematics dg vaishnav college chennai on the topic on some open problems in mathematics and the final talk was by dr s hariharan assistant professor department of mathematics dg vaishnav college chennai on the topic computational linear algebra the valedictory address was delivered by dr mukti acharya professor department of mathematics christ university bangalore dr mukti acharya emphasized the importance of research to be taken by faculties and research scholars thank you ma'am I am thankful to all the invited speakers of this UGC sponsored national level 7 days faculty development program for accepting our invitation to deliver the invited talks during the program. More than 400 participants registered for this program and over 600 views we have for this 7 days faculty development program as of now. My sincere thanks to all the faculties and participants throughout India for their interest and participation in this faculty development program. This program would immensely benefit their research career by providing great exposure in the topics presented. We have a virtual round of appreciation for all the participants. Today we have completed the seven days of national level virtual faculty development program. 
this program has evolutionized the concept of mathematics in a the concept of mathematics as well as the aspects of mathematics in a beneficial way for all the participants this ugc sponsored faculty development program was successfully conducted only because of the support and encouragement provided by the secretary shri ashok kumar mundra ji and principal dr s santosh babu of dg vaishnav college i thank the secretary and principal for providing the zoom platform and data center to conduct this program without any hindrance i sincerely thank dr k a venkatesh for the support and guidance given to conduct a series of activities like webinars conferences faculty development programs workshops and c4 uh, coaching class for net aspirants of the pg and research department of mathematics post graduate and research department of mathematics organizes this program to gain insight and information that would remain effective in their academics each topic for discussion on these seven days were chosen keeping in mind the interest of young researchers in the field of aspects of mathematics my heartfelt gratitude to the head of the post graduate and research department of mathematics professor r venkatramanan for taking tremendous effort to conduct this ugc sponsored seven days national level faculty development program my heartfelt thanks to the technical team of the faculty development program dr s hariharan assistant professor dr s vaidya subramanian assistant professor dr s mail wagner assistant professor and assistant professor m tirumal for their support to conduct this program in the zoom platform it's a glory glorious moment to extend my warm wishes to the faculty members of post graduate and research department of mathematics dg vaishnav college who sincerely committed to this event to make it a success i finally thank everyone involved with the conduct of this program this program is a stepping stone for future research in mathematics thank you all thank you ma'am the end of the story is a new beginning of for many others my heartfelt gratitude to everyone for their whole hearted support rendered in the success of the 7 days fdp program announcement for the participants the feedback link will be sent to your uh, mail id now i request everyone to rise for the national anthem जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा भिंज हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नाम जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे so thank you very much madam my namaskar to all of you good wishes for your college be in thank touch you. thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you be in touch whenever you need it okay thank you very much so i'm leaving okay yes ma'am thank you ma'am